We are pain, that's all. We are God in our history. Hey guys! This is Yurizi and I'm back with part 4 of what if Naruto was a simple teenage shop owner. Things aren't always as simple as they seem. Just because he found himself in a new world, Naruto shouldn't have forgotten this. Now he must deal with angel, fallen angels, devils, perverts and god, all while maintaining a relationship and running his store. Things can never be simple for him. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 14. For the last time Rias, I don't want to join your peerage. SSID girl let out a loud groan as she dramatically slumped down in her seat at Naruto's counter to her offer. Sat in front of her was an unobservant Kaneko who was silently munching away on a plate full of sugar cookies. But you could be closer to Ko, the girl was stopped in the middle of her sentence when a half-eaten cookie slammed into her forehead. The redhead turned her eyes to her rook and saw the Nekashu giving her a small glare. Don't do that. Kaneko stated just as a small, balled-up napkin smacked lightly against her face. Her eyes fell upon her boyfriend who was busy fulfilling orders for the customers in the shop. Don't waste food by throwing it at people. Naruto said without looking up from his work. Kaneko offered the boy a soft apology before turning back to Rias just in time to catch the girl blowing her a raspberry. The duo of King and Rook had made it a habit to visit Naruto's shop almost every day after school. Kaneko's reason were, of course, to visit and spend some quality time with her boyfriend. Rias, on the other hand, main intention was to try and recruit the boy to her peerage. Ever since watching his performance in the ratings game, the girl had been unrelenting in her attempt to get the boy to her side. Speaking of Naruto's actions, the blonde's assault on several mid to high tier devils and his interruption of a ratings game had left the blonde in some pretty deep shit when it came to the devils. It was best to say that he was on the wanted list of several devil clans. At the top of that list was the Phoenix clan for sure. When Lord Phoenix had awakened to the news that the engagement had been called off, he was not exactly the most receptive to the news. The man felt like he had been cheated and demanded that the decision be reversed due to Naruto's interference in the match. Unfortunately for him, Sir Zex was hearing none of it. To the Satan, his decision had been made and it was not changing. And with the backing of two other Satans, there was really nothing the Phoenix could do. So instead, the clan had effectively put out a hit for Naruto. Because the boy had made it rather clear that he was allied to no faction, the clan had put out an award of the boy's death. Both Rias and Kaneko had been furious when they heard about the bounty but were eventually were calmed. Serzex had attempted to bring Naruto to the underworld in order to work out some agreement or alliance with the blonde. While the Satan knew he didn't have a full gauge on the boy's ability, he still was able to sense the raw power that the shinobi contained. Being the first to ally with someone with such power would only be a boon to the devil's power. Unfortunately for the devil, Naruto was having none of it. The blonde made it clear that he wanted no involvement with the devils. The feeling seemed to be mutual as most of the devils that participated in the fight against the boy held a strong grudge towards him and wanted nothing less than to be working alongside him. Come on! You'll get awesome devil powers, no one in the underworld will be able to do anything to you and eventually you could get your own peerage. Rias was met with another deadpan look from the blonde. The girl released a sigh before deciding to stop with her recruiting attempts for today. Maybe tomorrow would be a better day. That idiot from before is approaching the shop by the way. Naruto paused momentarily in his action at his partner's comment before continuing to knead the lump of dough in his hand. You're going to have to be a bit more specific than that. I know a lot of idio never mind, I see what you mean. Naruto interrupted himself in the middle of the sentence as the man in question walked into the shop. The man's unkempt golden bangs were even more wild than usual considering the fact that they were covered in soot and ash. His burgundy trench coat had several holes burned into it. The man's exposed chest was littered with cuts and bruises that were leaking with various amounts of blood. Azazel didn't seem to pay his condition no mind as he entered the shop. Even as he bled onto the surface of the shop, the man didn't seem to be the least bit bothered by it. Everyone else around him didn't share the same opinion. Most were watching in disgust as the fallen angel bled so close to their food. Naruto sighed and tried to fight off his headache as Azazel finally noticed him. 
The man made an immediate beeline towards the counter, leaking blood the whole entire way. In the background, Naruto could see some of the customers bagging up their food and leaving the shop in mild disgust. I don't even know how I'm still open. Naruto muttered to himself as Azazel finally reached the counter. Both Rias and Kaneko stared openly at the man, their eyes widened at being so close to the leader of the fallen angels. The man paid their shocked stares no mind as he began to address the blonde. Fancy seeing you here Narukuen. The last time we met was in the middle of a forest. If we keep meeting like this, people could talk. Azazel started off with. Rias and Kaneko's jaws dropped even more at the utterly casual way the fallen angel was addressing the shop owner. First of all, don't say things like that. It's just plain weird. Second, why are bleeding? Third and most importantly, why are you bleeding in MY shop? Naruto punctuated with each statement by punching the dough in his hands. Once again, Azazel seemed completely oblivious to the boy's anger as he leaned against the counter, leaking blood on the clean surface. Oh, you know, I was just in the neighborhood and decided to pay my dear old buddy a visit. The casualness dripping from the man's voice served to further the shock the two girls were feeling and send Naruto even further into his frustration. You didn't answer a single one of my questions. Naruto's voice was frothing with frustration as he addressed the man. Azazel released a light chuckle before setting himself down on the stool next to Rias. I was just testing out some new experiments and this was the result. I think it's coming along pretty well. Azazel said as he reached for one of Kaneko's cookies. This seemed to snap the girl out of her shocked state as she slapped away the man's hand, causing him to start pouting at the girl. Naruto, do you have any idea who this is? Rias said as she steadily inched away from the man beside her. Naruto turned his head towards the apprehensive girl but not before slapping away Azazel's hand. Yes I do. He's an old, perverted fallen angel who is obsessed with stalking me and breasts. Or better known as Ero Tenshi. Naruto said matter-of-factly. Azazel was sent back into his pouting at the boy's comment. They mock what they do not understand. You guys are not better than that uptight bearded asshole in the sky. Azazel muttered out while staring dejectedly out the window. Naruto sighed at the man's childish behavior before going back to the making of his sweets, completely ignorant of the looks he was receiving from the two devils. First Ophis and now the fallen angels. Just how many supernatural beings have you encountered? Rias mumbled out. I broke out of heaven after being interrogated by Michael. The casualness in the boy's voice did little to stop the shock the girls felt at the comment. Michael? Like the Archangel Michael? The Michael that fought at God's side and is partly responsible for the death of Satan? That Michael? Rias rattled off in an uncontrolled manner. The situation was just too unbelievable for the girl to grasp. Naruto offered the girl a simple nod, sending her deeper into her disbelief. How can you be so casual about this? Kaneko asked while staring the boy. Naruto looked up from the girl, a small smile slowly crossing his face as it came within her view. It's pretty simple Kochan. These are just average days from a simple shop owner like myself. We have discovered the boy's location, Michael Sama. Michael looked up from his papers at the sudden voice. Standing in front of him was a low-level scouting with only a single set of wings. The man had his head bowed as he awaited his leader's reaction. Where was he hiding? Michael leaned back into his comfortable, leather chair as the man raised his head to report. He was discovered in the town of Kua which, if our reports are up to date, is under the control of the Gremory Devil Clan. Like the rumors have stated, the boy seems to have ownership of some type of sweet shop. I attempted to trail him after he left the shop but he is very elusive. I was unable to keep up with him. The man bowed his head once again as he reported his partial failure to his leader. Michael let out a disappointed sigh as he leaned back further in his chair. Raise your head. There's no need to be ashamed. I know personally of this boy's ability and I do not blame you for failing in your mission. Michael said. The angel in front of him raised his head and shot the man an appreciative look. What will be our next course of action, Michael Sama? The nameless angel asked. Michael stood from his chair, his wings flaring out behind him as he did so. The twelve golden wings only served to add more to the image of power the man held. You will be doing nothing. Report in your findings with Raphael and take the rest of the day off. You have earned it. Michael said while waving the man away. The angel offered his leader a deep bow before releasing his wings and flying out of the office. 
Should I be bothered that you keep eavesdropping on all of my conversations? Michael asked seemingly to no one. Seconds later, the ever-beautiful Gabriel revealed herself from her hidden position in her brother's office. I was just checking up on my little brother. You seem to be stressed as of lately and I know what stress can do to the body. Gabriel approached her fellow archangel. Michael released a sigh as his sister settled next to him. He felt the woman lay her hand on his shoulder as she tried to comfort him. You need to not stress yourself so much. It'll lead you to an early grave. Gabriel's rather morbid joke earned her a dry look from her brother, drawing out an embarrassed chuckle from the angel. Your jokes are in terrible taste as always. I don't even know how you haven't fallen yet for your terrible sense of humor. Both of the siblings exchanged a small round of laughter at Michael's words. To anyone else, the scene would be almost too surreal. Watching two of the strongest beings in heaven giggle and laugh as if they were primary school kids was something most people didn't get to see in their lifetimes. Ah, I enjoy moments like these. Helps distract me from all the chaos that is ensuing around the world. Michael said as his laughter started to die down. Gabriel's laughter was soon put to a stop as her brother once again sunk back into his depressed state. Do not think about it Michael. Take your mind off of things. Gabriel's calming voice would usually be able to calm the angel but today it didn't seem to be doing the trick. That's a lot simpler said than done. With the continuous decrease in our numbers, constant pressure from the two other factions and now this boy on the loose, my plate has been constantly full. I can't just take my mind off of it, even for a day. The God system makes sure of that. Michael's voice raised in intensity as he spoke about his daily woes. Gabriel's previous smile was once again gone as the signs of stress began to show on her brother. The bags under his eyes, the sagging of his shoulder and the slight redness of his eyes. The angel was suffering. Michael released a small sigh as he attempted to reel in his emotions. While he hadn't exactly yelled at Gabriel, he could feel his emotional mask slipping during his miniature rant. As a leader, that was unacceptable. While he didn't have the worry about falling so easily, he still needed to rein in control of his emotions which was turning out to be a pretty difficult task of its own. The archangel flinched as he felt a pair of arms wrap around his upper body. Behind him stood Gabriel who had her head laid against her brother's back as a soft lullaby left her lips. May your dreams bring you peace in darkness. May your always rise over the rain. May the light from above always lead you to love. May you stay in the arms of the angels. May you always be brave in the shadows till the sun shines upon you again. Hear this prayer in my heart and will ne'er be apart. May you stay in the arms of the angels. May you hear every song in the forest and if ever you lose your own way. Hear my voice like a breeze. Whisper soft through the trees. May you stay in the arms of the angels. May you grow up to stand as a man. Love with the pride of your family and name. When you lay down your head for to rest in your bed. May you stay in the arms of the angels. With each line of the song, Michael's form grew less and less tense. The soothing words of his sister filled the angel and gently swept away the worries he was feeling. By the end of the song, the blonde had succumbed to the warmth of his sister's embrace. Father used to sing that to us whenever we had problems going to sleep. He was always so gentle with us. Michael muttered out as he sank deeper and deeper into Gabriel's hug. The woman behind him released a small hum as she rubbed her cheek against her brother's back. Would you have preferred him not to be? Gabriel's voice was muffled as she spoke into Michael's back but the angel still heard her loud and clear. As much as I would like to say yes, the real answer is no. His gentleness taught me how to appreciate moments like this. The two supernatural creatures descended into silence as the outside noise bled into the office. The two paid it no mind as they continued their embrace content to enjoy the rare emotional moment with each other. Naruto glanced in between the two people that were currently occupying his shop. The street light filtered in through the large windows at the front of the shop. A soft, pale and natural moonlight mixed with the artificial light of the street lights, giving the interior of the shop a soft glow. Why did things have to be so complicated? Why did he seem to attract the weirdest and quirkiest of individuals? How had he even managed to fool himself into thinking that he could just settle down and run a candy shop? Looking back at the idea right now was making Naruto realize just how stupid he was being. The blonde shook his head violently in order to derail the train of thought and shoved it away for a later time. There was no use in focusing on it now. 
Especially since the two people in front of him were probably thinking he was crazy the longer he kept quiet. So, do you mind explaining to me the situation again? Naruto started off within a slow, drawl voice. The teen's patience had already been tested by a certain leader of the Grigori and the current situation was not helping at all, especially since the man was one of the duo standing in front of him. You see, I recently took Valachan under my wing and he has progressed beautiful when it comes to combat. But I've started to worry for him recently. He's so combative and reclusive at times. Sometimes he locks himself in his room for hours and refuses to come out. I want him to get out more often and interact with more people. And I figured you could use some extra help so I was thinking you could offer him a job. Azazel relented with mock worry in his voice. From an outsider's perspective, the fallen angel's speech could almost be seen as sincere. His voice, his mannerisms, and his expression all pointed towards the man actually caring about the situation. Though, if one truly knew the fallen angel, they would immediately know it was all a ruse. Naruto attempted to hold in a sigh at the man's behavior while subtly glancing over to the teen standing beside the fallen angel. The silver-haired boy looked to be a second away from striking the fallen angel if his twitching eyebrow was anything to go by. This is honestly so ridiculous. Valen muttered with his arms crossed. To be completely honest, the boy shouldn't have been that surprised. Azazel had been pulling crap like this since the day the fallen angel had taken him under his wings, no pun intended. Azazel had been the one to find Valley when the boy had run away from his father. Years of abuse from the devil had made the decision to run away rather easy of the young Longinus user. His father was beyond abusive as he attempted to end his life on several occasions. Once he escaped from his father, the divine dividing wielder had spent weeks wandering the country. His nights were spent huddled in a ball for warmth while his days were spent attempting to find any tiny scrap of food he could. It was a difficult life but Valley preferred it much over the life he lived with his father. It was about two months into his homelessness when Valley encountered the fallen angel. The boy had been going on his usual midday raid of the inattentive vendors that littered the streets of the city when he bumped into Azazel. And by bump, he literally meant bump as he slammed full force into the man's chest as he turned to escape with a mouthful of food. Originally Valley was freaked out considering the fact that he had just plainly stolen from a vendor and Azazel was staring at him like he was the finest piece of meat ever served. The devil had been seconds away from turning and running in the opposite direction when Azazel finally spoke. The Grigori leader came off as caring, sensible and reliable and before long, without him even knowing, Valley had subconsciously warmed up to him. The fallen angel had taken him out to eat, bought him new clothes and even provided him with a motel room to stay in for several nights. All of it came off as too real to be true for the devil so his first night in the motel had been spent attempting to dispel the illusion around him. It wasn't until the third day after meeting Azazel that Valley realized that what he was experiencing was actually happening. And instead of being happy for the realization, the boy had grown suspicious. For years, his own father had been one of the biggest sources of pain for the boy. If his own father couldn't even muster up the emotions to care about him, how could this random guy do the same? This line of thought had led to Valley abandoning the motel room gifted to him and running away once again. Though, unknown to the devil, he was being watched by the very same person he was running away from. And you can bet that the person wasn't going to let him get away so easily. Azazel had quickly caught up to the boy and confronted him on his reasons for leaving. Valley, still not trusting the man at all, initially ignored him and tried to go around the fallen angel. Azazel was having none of that as he mirrored the boy's steps, blocking each of his escape routes. Eventually Valley grew tired of the cat and mouse game and unleashed his powers in order to intimidate the man in front of him. The devil knew of his true lineage and the power that came with it. His body housed an unholy amount of demonic power. Based on that alone, he could have been considered one of the most powerful youths then and there. To the boy's shock, Azazel didn't grow fearful and take off running towards the hill. No, the man did the exact opposite. He had actually started to laugh at him. The laugh wasn't just a short-lived chuckle either. It was a full-blown, stomaching aching laugh that had almost sent the fallen angel collapsing onto his news. It did, however, send the descendant of the original Lucifer into a pit of confusion. He had been promptly pulled out of that pit when Azazel had suddenly stopped his laughter. The mirthful look that had just been present in the man's eyes had disappeared. The sudden switch in personality had caught Valley off guard but what the man did next caught him even more off guard. With a simple grunt of exertion, twelve jet black, glossy, feathered wings came shooting out of the man's back. 
and with the appearance of those wings came the presence of something absolutely vile. A feeling of dread filled Valley as the intangible, vile object seemed to surround him. His body seemed to grow cold and numb as the presence assaulted his every sense. His body had grown cold and numb as he was forced to collapse to the ground. He felt that his heart had been seconds away from stopping, and just as suddenly as it appeared, it went away. The sense of dread and the nightmarish presence had vanished. With its disappearance, the half-devil had regained control over his body as he scrambled up to his feet, his breath labored from the sudden action. You have incredible power yet you lack direction. You will eventually die, most likely in a ditch somewhere, if you do not learn to control it. Come with me and I'll teach you. Vala still remembered the man's words. In retrospect, the teen wanted to go back and slap his younger self for being so naive. Azazel could have easily been plotting to use him or experiment him, especially considering the fact he had a sacred gear. Luckily for the devil, Azazel kept to his word. The fallen angel had trained him. His training sessions with the fallen angels could be best described as experimental. Every single day, the man would throw something completely new at the boy. Valley had quickly learned to never not expect anything from the fallen angel. Training could consist of simple cardio exercises to waking up in the middle of a frozen tundra with no supplies, no map and a simple not telling him to find his way home. All of it was a pain in the ass to the teen but he couldn't complain. Though it may have been a pain, the fallen angel had torn the boy down to his base and built him back up, stronger than ever. That didn't take away from the fact that the man was fucking insane and annoying as hell. This current situation he found himself in was just one of the many examples of the men's annoying tendencies. I'm sorry but no. Valley released a sigh of relief at the blonde's answer. Good. That's another pain in the ass dodged. He had no doubt that working at this shop would be troublesome. He doesn't even look like he would last a day here. Wait what? If there was one thing that Valley would freely admit about himself it would be that he was extremely competitive. His time under his father and Azazel made sure of that. And due to his competitive nature, the blonde's comment struck a nerve within him. What do you mean I wouldn't last? Those were the first words spoken between the devil and the shinobi. Valley was obviously irritated by the teen's comment. After all, who was this blonde anyway to say stuff like that about him? He was the descendant of the original Lucifer. He held one of the strongest sacred gears in existence. He suffered daily training under the leader of the fallen angels for God's sake. He could handle anything this little shop could throw at him. You heard me. I can already see it. You would quit within a day if I asked you to do something as simple as the cash register. You aren't made for this type of stuff. Naruto's tone was very dismissive which served to piss Valley off even more. The silver-haired boy took a step towards the shop owner while releasing a loud snarl. You don't know me. I'll take anything you throw at me and destroy it. The amount of conviction in the boy's voice brought a smile to Azazel's face. Even though he was sure that Valley was just pissed off at Naruto's comments, it was nice to see the boy being passionate about something other than training. Oh really then? Naruto questioned while looking the boy up and down. Several tense seconds followed the blonde statement as he took several steps towards the duo. Valley looked to be seconds away from decking the shinobi as the blonde got into his personal space. If you're so tough then meet me here at 5 am and prepare to start taking inventory. If you don't show up, I'll just take that as you admitting that you can't handle this business. Now get out. Naruto calmly said. Before either Valley or Azazel could even react, both found themselves standing on the outside of the shop. Valley blinked wildly at the sudden change in environment while Azazel released a low chuckle to himself. What the hell just happened? Valley asked. You, my sweet, little Valachan, just got yourself your first real job. Now let's go get you tucked into bed. I have a feeling that tomorrow will be a hard day for you. Chapter 15 A cold shudder ran up Vala's spine as the cold winter air blasted against his body. The boy's breath was visible as he stood with his arms crossed over his chest in a feeble attempt to retain some of his body heat. A harsh scowl marked his face as he glanced down at the piece of paper locked between his fingers. It's already been two hour. The boy muttered to himself as he crushed the piece of paper before burning it with the usage of his devil power. He had been rudely awakened earlier that morning by a way too overly enthusiastic Azazel. The fallen angel had come charging into his room, waking him up for his rather peaceful sleep, 
before slamming a piece of paper on his chest and dashing back out. It had taken several seconds to fully awaken from the rude wake-up call before he even read the paper. The paper was orange in color and had the simple message of, don't forget, 5 a.m., written on it. Seeing that it was already four-ish, the devil had dragged himself out of bed, gotten dressed and made his way over to the shop. That was two hours ago. It was now 6 a.m. and there was absolutely no sign of the blonde. The bitter, winter cold made the wait seem twice as long. Each minute that the teen was forced to wait was another minute he was closer to blowing up the shop. No one would even know it was me. Valen mumbled to himself as his hands began to heat up from him channeling his demonic energy into him. He uncrossed his arms as twin orbs of energy formed against his palms. The orbs began to grow in size as Valley continued to feed them more and more of his energy. What do you think you're doing? All the built-up energy immediately died down when Valley heard a voice from behind him. The boy turned and came face to face with a warmly clothed Naruto with Kaneko by his side. Where the hell have you been? I've been waiting out here for two hours and you just casually show up like this? Valley yelled. Naruto blankly stared back at the irritated teen before walking past him to the door of the shop. Vala looked close to snapping as the blonde took out a key and opened up the door before stepping inside. This boy is really testing your patience. And you're really failing that test. Vala released a loud grunt at his partner's words. Don't try to play his actions off as a test. He doesn't deserve to be let off so easily. Albion sighed at his host's response before going silent, realizing that the boy was too wrapped up in his anger to reason with. With his partner now silent, Valley made a weak attempt at reigning in his anger before ultimately failing and following after the blonde. As soon as he entered, he was taken off guard as an apron slammed into his face. The devil quickly ripped away the garment from his face to glare at Naruto. The blonde didn't seem the least bit bothered by the glare as he settled himself down at one of the tables with Kaneko. Storage is in the back along with the inventory checklist. Make sure everything is in order before we open. The lackadaisical way the blonde addressed him served to irritate the teen even more. And the devil was getting very close to violently expressing this irritation to his, boss. Aren't you at least going to show me where to go, boss? The last word was said with such thinly veiled sarcasm that Valley was sure that the shinobi would verbally retaliate. Fortunately for the devil, Naruto didn't seem to be too bothered by the remark as he stood from his seat and gestured for the sacred gear user to follow him. The teen led them behind the counter of the shop and through its back doors. Valley was immediately taken back by the massive designs that covered the entirety of the floor and hallway walls. The hallway seemed to glow and pulsate with an entrancing sort of power that served to mesmerize the devil. He didn't have much time to examine the glowing patterns as he was dragged further back into the shop. Everything should be organized in the fridge and freezers. Just make sure everything is there and tell me if I should order some new stuff. Have fun. And with those words, the blonde turned and left the room, leaving Valley alone in the arctic cold room with a clipboard and a bad attitude. Why am I even doing this? I have much more important things to do. Valley grumbled under his breath as the blonde's footsteps grew more and more faint. Because your pride refuses to allow you to turn away from it now since the boy made it seem like you were too weak to accomplish it. Admittedly, the only reason you're here is because of your own stupid pride. Valley huffed at his partner's comment but said nothing as he knew the dragon was partially right. If there was one thing that boy valued behind his fighting strength, it was his pride. Just shut up and let's get this over with. Are you being serious with me right now, Raphael? After that speech you made in the meeting, are you really going back on everything you said? It was only the beginning hours of the day and Michael could already tell that today was going to be a pain in the ass. The day had started with a weekly report on his desk. Reading through the document confirmed what the seraph feared, more and more angels were falling to the call of sin. Their numbers were dwindling rapidly and as for right now, there was no end in sight. After sitting and praying, an activity that he wasn't sure had any effect nowadays, he started his daily round of meetings. Everything from low-level angels complaining of housing issues to archangels requesting less missions were heard by the stand-in God. Most of the requests or issues were rather mundane and didn't really require his personal attention. It was a task that was probably better off be delegated to a lesser being but Michael felt that it was his personal responsibility to hear them out, no matter how picayune they may be. Fortunately for the blonde, his bland meetings had been interrupted by the appearance of one of his top generals, Raphael. Raphael was one of Michael's most trusted advisors and one of his greatest friends. 
The angel of healing had stood by his side during the war against the devils and fallen angels. He had been there for him during the mourning of his father. He had been at the forefront of the people who supported him taking over the role of God. The archangel was considered one of the wisest amongst the heavenly court. His powers of healing made him well worshipped and respected by both humans and angels. His word was considered golden and should never be taken lightly. Having him by his side had been a great boon early in Michael's transition to his new position. I know that it's sudden but recent events have made it clear to me that this militarization and pursuit of the boy isn't the best idea. The angel was straight-faced as he addressed his superior and friend. Michael released an exhausted sigh as he reclined back into his chair. This was not what he needed to be hearing right now. What is with this sudden change in heart? He asked, his voice a mixture of exhaustion, frustration and curiosity. Raphael seemed to pick up on these emotions as his own face softened before he began to address his friend. You forget that I am the one who puts together that folder you have on your desk every week. I am not ignorant to the knowledge that our numbers are falling. While we are not in immediate danger, we are certainly nowhere near full strength. With the patrol we sent out and the beefed up border, our actual combat numbers, at the moment, are at an all-time low. Plus our extra presence on earth is drawing warning flags from the other factions. Our actions could unintentionally lead to war. Raphael explained. Silence hung between the two for several long seconds as Michael took in the information. His emotions were unreadable as a mask of stoicism settled upon his face. What's the real reason, Raphael? I know you. You may not be one for arrogance but you take pride in the strength of our brethren yet here you are doubting them because of our numbers. We both know you don't fully believe in any of that. Raphael looked caught off guard by the angel's statement. His surprised look was met with a stoic glance from Michael, showing that the angel hadn't fallen for it at all. Raphael released a small chuckle as he threw his arms up in the air. Fine, fine. You got me. I should have realized that I couldn't get by you that easily. He lowered his arms back to down to his side as his face took on a more serious tone. That still doesn't mean I don't believe that we should ease up on spreading ourselves so thin. When you give me the real reason as to why you think that, maybe I may take your worries into consideration. Raphael stayed silent for a moment at his friend's response before releasing a small sigh. I think we should attempt to recruit the boy or at the very least ally with him. The incredulous look that greeted him almost forced a chuckle out of Raphael but he managed to hold it in. Michael didn't seem as amused as he shot up from his seat. Are you okay? Are you sick? Are you in the process of falling or something? I've never seen you go back on your own decision this quickly in my whole lifetime. It was only a week ago that you were calling for this boy's capture and death. If the situation hadn't been so serious, Raphael would have been touched by the sincerity in his friend's concern. He wasn't too surprised by Michael's reaction. After all, he, himself, had a reputation for a stubborn streak. I assure you that I am completely fine. My original judgment was based off an initial reaction to the news that heaven had apparently been invaded. Now that I have had time to fully assess the situation, I can speak with a much clearer sense of mind. Raphael and Michael entered into a staring match as neither refused to back down from each other. While it lacked the coldness that it usually carried, Raphael's face was still contorted into his patent, emotionless mask. Michael's brow was creased with worry as his eyes scanned over his friend's face for a sign. What that sign was, he didn't know exactly. After a full minute of silent staring, Michael seemed to admit defeat as he collapsed back into his seat. The man's hand came up to his forehead as he began to nurse a headache he was sure was only going to grow worse. Explain to me what changed your mind. And don't give me any more fake reasons, Raphael shook off his friend's dismissive tone as he stood from his seat. As you know, that boy is located within the town of Kuo, a well-known territory for devils. We don't have much influence there but with the admission of Asia Argento into the town, I called for an increase of our presence in the city. While the church may have excommunicated her, she is still too valuable of an asset to just leave unattended, especially in a territory with such high devil activity. The angel of healing started off as a folder materialized in his hand. He placed the folder down on Michael's desk and allowed the seraph to open it before continuing. I had several low-level angels place themselves amongst the town folk a few weeks before in preparation for her arrival. I lost contact with them a while ago and with having no idea what was going on, decided against sending any more scouts to the area. 
I kept with this idea until a week ago when the boy escaped heaven. I thought that there may have been a possibility that he was responsible for the deaths of the angels. Michael paid rapt attention to his general's words as he flipped through the folder. The folder was filled with numerous reports and pictures of Ko. Everything from its forest's density to its industry area was included with the reports, so I sent a small group of scouts down into Ko once again. They unfortunately learned that the original group had been killed by a faction of fallen angels that had taken refuge in one of the abandoned churches in Ko. I would have immediately charged down there myself and rid them of their lives if it wasn't for the fact that Ko belonged to one of the higher-ranking devil families and we weren't exactly supposed to be there in the first place. The situation definitely was not pleasant, however, the second group of scouts managed to retrieve the original group's reports that were left untouched by the fallen angels. That report is in your hands right now. Raphael paused in his talking as Michael continued to idly flip through the folder. Okay. While I'm not exactly too upset at the fact that we managed to infiltrate a devil territory, I still don't see how any of this managed to shape your opinion on what to do with the child. Michael said as he closed the folder before placing it back on his desk. Raphael nodded before reaching down and taking the folder for himself, beginning to flip through it immediately. At first, it had no effect on my own opinion. That's until I started to actually read the full report. One thing that stood out amongst all of the reports was a sudden spike in the natural energy around Ko. Michael frowned at the mention of Senjutsu. The corruption of Earth's life force, one of the last remaining pieces of his father, was not something he enjoyed hearing about. So are you saying that a yukai managed to find its way in Ko? Michael questioned. His question was immediately answered with a negative shake of Raphael's head. I assumed the same thing before reading further into the report. While it had the markings of natural energy, it was different from the type that the yukai used. Our scouts reported that it felt, pure. The best way to describe it is how they put it, just like heaven. Michael's eyebrow shot up at the revelation. No one should have been able to replicate the perfect conditions of heaven. That's what made it heaven. It was a one-of-a-kind paradise, and the center point of this energy just so happened to be at the candy shop and the surrounding forest. Raphael stopped to allow the information to sink in for Michael. This may coincide with the reason why his name isn't present in the Book of Life. Michael mumbled out. Now it was Raphael's turn to be shocked at a revelation. His name wasn't in the book. So he is a devil? Michael gave a negative shake of his head once again as he gave a snap of his fingers. Within a bright flash of light, the Book of Life appeared before the duo. As you know, the Book of Life records the name, information and life of all living creatures. Any name that isn't recorded is that of a natural-born devil. Even our fallen brethren have their names recorded. This fact led me to assume that the boy was a devil except for one thing. He was present in the seventh level of heaven and didn't instantly combust into flames. If he was a devil, his presence in heaven would have been the most torturous experience of his life. So he isn't an angel. He isn't a devil. He also isn't a fallen angel. Most likely isn't a yukai. He's not a human since his name isn't recorded in the book so no hero descendant. We don't even know where he is from. What in the Lord's name is he then? Raphael questioned. Michael didn't respond for several seconds before slowly opening the Book of Life to the back. Unknown to most, the Book of Life has one exception when it comes down to who it records. While it is a creation of our father, some creatures manage to get around its all-knowing ability. These creatures are mostly exclusive to gods of other mythologies. Michael turned the book towards a nervous Raphael. While this wasn't his first time getting a glance at the Book of Life, it was certainly the furthest he had been in it. The Archangel was surprised to see two completely blank pages. Actually, the closer that he looked, the more he realized that the pages weren't actually blank. Small pieces of writing could be seen briefly on the paper before they were washed away like sand on the beach. This process seemed to continue on endlessly, never lasting long enough for Raphael to get a full glance of one of the names. Everyone from Zeus to name of the Buddhas are supposed to be contained on these pages. Unfortunately with their own divine power, they have managed to bypass the book's power. All information we have on them is fully artificial. Michael said as he pulled the book back towards himself before closing it. With the information you have given me today, I have reached one conclusion. Our target isn't just a boy. He is most likely an entity, a god like our father. From which faction, I do not know. 
He could be the worship figure of a backwater tribe of people or even an unknown nature god of one of the well-known myths. We do not know. But there's one thing for certain. We can no longer treat this boy as a simple nuisance. I thank you, Raphael. You have opened my eyes to his potential ally or an even greater threat with the information you have gathered. Raphael blinked in shock as Michael shot up from his seat and bowed to him. It was very rare that the blonde showed such a level of humility and respect to anyone excluding his sister or his late father. Think nothing of it, brother. Anything for the continuation of our father's legacy. Raphael said. Michael raised from his bow and offered the archangel a small smile before Raphael turned and exited the room. Is this one of your blessings father? Have you used Raphael to uncover my eyes to a gift you have left for us? I can only assume that this boy's presence is your will and I will follow it and him to my grave. He glanced silently up at the ceiling of his office for several long moments before bowing his head once again and disappearing from the room in a brilliant flash of life. He had work to do. Young man, my cookies were several underbaked. Now let me be clear. I've been coming to this place ever since it opened up and I've come to expect A-class quality from here. This is the first time I've been truly disappointed by one of your products. Now, this doesn't mean I'm going to demonize the shop but next time time I. Valley had long since drowned out the excessive, whining of the customer in front of him. To be completely honest, it wasn't that hard to do. He didn't care much about her opinion of the shop or her cookie order. It was about midday in Kuo and Naruto's shop was in full swing. People on the lunch break were flooding in and out of the house for a quick taste of the sum sweets in order to get them through the rest of their days. It was a constant and repetitive flow of people that helped keep the shop afloat. Usually Naruto would be manning the register considering the fact that just earlier that week, he was the only employee present. But with the addition of Valley to the team, the blonde had immediately put the devil to work as the cashier. The owner, himself, was still behind the counter except now he was making him busy by making more snacks and watching Valley attempt to hold in his anger. Furthermore, do you guys make your lemonade fresh squeezed? If so, I highly recommend you guys start doing so. It gives the beverage a much higher quality taste. A simple change can take this business a long way. Hey, are you listening to me young man? I am your customer and I demand that you listen to my co, the portly man's complaints were put to a stop when his, underbaked, cookie, the thing that had started off this whole rant slammed into his face with enough force to actually force to man to stumble backwards a few steps. A series of astonished sputters exited the man's mouth as he looked between an agitated valley and the crumbled remains of his cookie. H how? How dare you? You call this proper customer service? This behavior is absolutely despicable. Outrageous. I want to speak with your manager Im. Another cookie sailed through the air and slammed into the man's forehead, this one sending him to the ground. He attempted to scramble back up to his feet but was halted as a hail of cookies rained upon him. A terrified scream accompanied the man's departure as he crawled his way to the main entrance of the shop and out of the door, leaving behind a whole room full of shocked customers. Vallis stood with several cookies in his hand as all eyes turned towards the teenage devil. He watched as some picked up their meals before dashing out of the shop, causing him to release a hush as he lowered his cookie projectiles. Those cookies will be coming out of your paycheck. Plus you're going to have to sweep up those crumbs. Vallis turned to shoot a scowl at his blonde boss. The teen didn't seem to register the nasty look as he continued to knead away at the dough in his hands. Why should I have to pay for that? You heard that man. Anyone would've did what I did after listening to that slob babble on about his stupid cookies. The devil's tone was bitter, his agitation clearly showing in his speech. It was bad enough that he had to work but now he was getting his pay deducted. Once again, you don't have to work here. You have no obligation to him, this shop or anyone. The only thing that is keeping you chained to this place is your own pride. His partner's voice echoed loudly in his head. Vala's scowl deepened as he turned away from Naruto, not even bothering to listen to the blonde's response. Shut your trap, you old lizard. Valley huffed while making his way over towards the sanitation equipment. His partner's words weren't true. He was doing this for good reasons. Reasons that he couldn't name currently, didn't mean they didn't exist, though. A brief sting of pain ripped through Vala's head, causing the boy to stumble during his walk. The devil quickly recovered and directed his head towards the door, his eyes narrowing in the process. If he had looked to his side, 
he would have noticed that his boss had the same exact look. The room seemed to grow cold as two men wearing trench coats entered the shop. The temperature took a nosedive as a light mist followed in behind the duo. Customers froze in the middle of their meals as the chill of the room dug into their bodies. Valen met eyes with the taller of the duo and had to stop himself from gasping at the man's identity. These two weren't supposed to be here. Had Azazel sent them or had they come on their own accord? If it was the latter, what was that accord? The devil's questions went unanswered as the two figures stride past him straight towards the register. The cold temperature that accompanied their arrival persisted as Gott got closer and closer to shop's counter. Naruto paid the duo no mind as he continued to meticulous molding of his dough. Excuse me. The man's voice was a deep, rich baritone. It was voice that contained power, a deep and ancient power that commanded respect with its very present. Unfortunately for the voice and its owner, Naruto didn't care much for power. Naruto's finger sunk deep into the dough as he continued to work it over, completely ignoring the presence of the two people standing before him. The cold air that flowed around the incognito duo did little to bother the blonde as he threw the dough from hand to hand. I said excuse me. The owner of the deep voice spoke out once again, a slight tension now present in his voice. Being ignored was certainly something the man didn't feel like going through. Once again, unfortunately for the man's dwindling patience, he was interacting with Naruto Uzumaki. A pleasant hum began to emit from Naruto's lips, an action that unknowingly broke the last bit of patience that the man had. A small twitch of the man's brow was the only indication of his irritation as his partner seemed to take that as his cue to step in. Excuse me sir. Are you the one named Naruto Uzumaki? This statement seemed to finally catch Naruto's attention as he looked up from his inordinate amount of dough kneading. The blonde had a pleasant smile on his face. Yes it is. Is there any reason why you two fallen angels are in my shop? The casualness in the boy's voice threw the duo off. They hadn't been expecting such a direct statement from him. Though that didn't deter them for long. I'm sorry if you see our presence troubles you. I can assure you that we are here on friendly terms. We mean you nor your shop any harm. The taller of the two spoke as he dropped his hood, his partner following suit behind him. In the background, Valley bit down a curse as Barakil and Shemhazai's identities were unveiled. Naruto waved off the man's apologies while stepping out from behind his counter. The blonde then proceeded to reach his back, causing the fallen angel duo to tense up as they prepared for a surprise attack. Valley clutched onto the broom in his hand as he prepared to defend his boss. Even though he found the blonde human to be an annoyance, he didn't think a human versus two generals of the fallen angel army was a very fair fight. Everyone was relieved when they realized that Naruto was simply undoing the knot that was holding his smock together. The blonde balled up the garment and threw it behind the counter before turning and facing the duo once again. You guys don't bother me. I'm pretty sure it's bothering my customers. The smoke is a bit over the top, don't you think? Naruto asked. Barakil nodded his head before turning to look at Shem Hazai. The fallen angel released a small grunt before the oppressing presence, along with the smoke, disappeared from the shop, much to the relief of the remaining customers. Naruto released a pleasant hum as the relaxed atmosphere returned to the shop. That is much better. Now let's take this conversation somewhere else. Barakil offered the teen a small nod before following after him with Shem Hazai in tow. Naruto got back behind the counter and was about to walk into the back room before stopping in his tracks. He turned towards the still shocked valley and offered his fellow teen a small wave. Man the shop for me a bit. Make sure you don't throw any more cookies. The blonde then descended into the back of the shop with the fallen angel, leaving the devil teen all alone with a shop full of customers. You know, it's a bit foolish to think that the boy is a normal human when he has connection with Azazel. You shouldn't make assumptions, child. They'll get you killed. Valley was snapped out of his shock by his partner's words. A small scowl placed itself on his face as he quickly made his way back towards the counter. I'm starting to realize that myself. But I'm not sensing any sort of supernatural energy coming from him. He does have a very strong life force though. Still an annoying asshole. A lot of the people you interact with are assholes. The question you should be asking is, have you found yourself a new ally or do you have another target that you'll eventually have to do with? Who know? Either way, I'm prepared to kick his ass no matter what it comes down to. Chapter 16 Can I offer either of you guys a drink or maybe you would enjoy a cookie? 
Barakil and Shemhazai glanced to each other as the blonde went about recommending different snacks and treats to them. The teen had his back turned to the trio, an action that screamed of ignorance and defenselessness. It was hard to believe that the person rambling about snacks in front of them was the same person who managed to defeat their leader. Though, considering how Azazel could act at times, it probably shouldn't have been too surprising to either of them. Not to seem too disrespectful but we will both have to decline. Our presence here is for other reasons. Barakil stated, causing Naruto to turn towards the two with a slightly hurt look on his face. The look quickly disappeared as the blonde recomposed himself in front of the duo, taking on a more serious air as his posture stiffened. You're right. Is it right for me to assume that you guys are with Azazel? It was the fallen angel's turn to stiffen at the directness in the boy's statement. The 180 degree change in the blonde's reaction was a little disarming though neither of them were complaining. A more serious attitude would hopefully speed this whole process up. After all, this was an issue that they were hoping would have been taken care of weeks ago, but thanks to Azazel, it had been delayed to up to this point. You would be correct. Before any assumptions are made, we would like to apologize for his actions. We never intended for things to grow as out of hand as they did with him. While he is our leader, his actions do not represent our intentions when it comes to our relationship with you. Barakil gave a slight bow of his head, an action that the fallen angel rarely ever did. It was a huge show of respect which was something Barakil had for few people. There's no need for any of that. I've been dealing with perverted idiots my whole life. Azazel is no different from the rest of them. The teen's statement brought a small chuckle from Shemhazi, earning the fallen angel a harsh glance from his partner. The man didn't seem to bothered by the look as he waved it away with a flippant shake of his hand. Don't give me that look Barakil. The boy is right. Azazel is a perverted idiot and I'm glad that other people are starting to realize that. Shemhazai said to his partner's face before turning to face Naruto. The man seemed a lot more relaxed now that he had started to speak with the teen. His demeanor was as if he was speaking with a friendly face instead of a potential enemy. Look kid, I've never been one for beating around the bush. That's just not how I operate. I leave most of the talking to Bara and Azazel. But you seem like my type of guy. So I'm going to be straightforward with you. We want you to work with us. If you're strong enough to beat Azazel, even if the idiot was most likely messing around, then you're good enough for me. So how about it? The fallen angel couldn't have been more direct in his tone, a fact that served to draw a sigh out from Barakil. I should have figured something like this would happen. He was just complaining about how Azazel doesn't stick to plans yet he goes off and does the exact same thing. The man couldn't help but think to himself. It was partly his fault for not stopping Shemhazai in the first place but he assumed the action would only make the duo look unorganized and eventually push the blonde away from wanting to join them. And if the rumors about the boy were true, that would be a very bad situation for the fallen angel faction. Naruto couldn't help but be amused at the silent interaction between the two. Shemhazai looked as happy as he could be while Barakil looked to be seconds away from choking the life out of his partner. The two reminded him of the earlier relationship between himself and Sasuke. Though, it was pretty weird that two beings that were hundreds of years old could emulate the behavior of two teenage boys. I'm sorry to say this but I have to say no. No offense to either of you or your organization but I rather stay out of all of this crap. Naruto tried his very best to make sure his statement came off as polite as possible. He didn't want to incite another fight within his shop when there were customers only a few feet away. I sincerely request that you change your mind about this decision. You do not have to give us an answer immediately but we do ask that you give this more thought. Barakil stepped in as he sensed Shemhazai was about to open his mouth and say something that would lower their chances of recruiting the boy even more. Once again, I don't want to seem disrespectful but my decision will still be no. It will be no tomorrow and it will be no the day after that. This isn't a decision that I am easily going to be swayed on. The mirth from Naruto's voice was slowly beginning to fade away as the tension in the room started to rise. That is a shame. We were really hoping that you would see things our way. Barakil commented as Shemhazai shuffled awkwardly next to him. The trio of men descended into an awkward silence as the tension reached its apex. Don't be fooled. The one to the right is building up his energy. I suggest you act first or you risk the safety of your precious customer. Karama spoke up from his silence. The frown on Naruto's face deepened as he realized just how out of hand the situation was getting. 
And here I was, hoping that we could handle this without getting violent. Guess things really never according to plan. The blonde couldn't help but sigh to himself, earning him an amused snort from his prisoner. You wouldn't be you if every day of your life didn't include some type of violence. It was Naruto's turn to snort. He couldn't deny the tailed beast's comment. Even since his arrival in this world, his daily routine contained some type of excitement or chaos. He honestly didn't think he would be able to function without it. You got me there. Still, I wish this could have been avoided. The shorter one seemed like a pretty nice guy. Just as Naruto had that thought, Barakil spoke up. Restrain the boy. The man's order was simple yet his partner seemed to fully understand. Without any hesitation, Shem Hazai slammed his glowing palms onto the floor of the room. Naruto stiffened as he felt an overwhelming pressure land down upon his shoulder. His attention was forced down to the glowing seal that was now present beneath his feet. It wasn't too hard of an assumption to make that the seal was the fallen angel's doing. I truly am sorry for this but you don't seem to grasp the magnitude of this decision. This is for the preservation and advancement of our race. We are not sure when people will come to we must do what we must until that day becomes clear. I hope that you do not take it personally. Barakil stated as he walked up towards the immobile blonde. Naruto raised an eyebrow up at the fallen angel as the man began to mutter strange incantations beneath his breath. The man's speech was in a completely different language, making it complete gibberish to the captured shinobi. I almost feel bad about this. Naruto's comment did little to slow Barakil in his speech, an action that the fallen angel would soon come to regret. The shinobi glanced over to a stoic Shemhazai before shooting the man a small smirk before disappearing from the room in a bright, yellow flash. Shit! Shemhazai shouted as he watched their target disappear. The fallen angel was so caught off guard by the action that he wasn't able to fully react when Naruto appeared behind him. His hesitation cost him as Naruto was able to place his hand on the fallen angel's shoulder and flash back out of the room. Barakil turned as the absence of his partner immediately became known to him. The man's energy signature had been directly behind him only a second ago but now it was completely gone. Not even a small glimpse of it could be sensed by the fallen angel, a fact which only served to put Barakil more on guard. Like you said earlier, I hope you don't take this personally. Barakil turned with a light spear in hand as the blonde's voice assaulted his ears. With blinding speed, he stabbed the spear forward in hopes of skewering the team that had so easily dealt away with his partner. Unfortunately for the fallen angel, Naruto easily sidestepped the rushed attack before grabbing onto Barakil's extended arm. Now let it be known, Barakil had taken a part in his fair share of teleportation magic. The act of flying quickly lost its novelty when there were methods that were much faster. His first experience using the branch of spells had left him without his breakfast. Having your body ripped through time and space tended to do that to you. Though he eventually grew used to the feeling. Nothing could have prepared him for the experience of the flying god technique. The amount of force and pressure the technique pushed upon the fallen angel had left the man gasping for air when he finally managed to escape its grasp. He vaguely noticed Shemhazai's absence as he collapsed down onto his hands and knees while taking in huge gulps of air. Really wish we could have gotten along better. I don't blame you guys for being so forceful but maybe next time try saying please before you go try to kidnap a person. If you ever need some snacks for your faction, feel free to place an order anytime. See you later. Barakil was vaguely aware of the words that Blonde was saying as he tried to recover from having his body forcibly moved through time and space. It was only after several minutes of stomach churning nausea was Barakil able to climb back up to his feet. That boy. The fallen angel muttered to himself as he began to take note of his surroundings. The Blonde had moved the man into what seemed to be a desert. He could see nothing but long stretches of sand for miles. The heat coming off the sand was already causing a sweat to form against his skin. I'm going to strangle that child when I get my hands on him. First I have to locate that other idiot. And with, the fallen angel unfurled his wings and took off to the skies. You have five seconds to explain what just happened or I'll blow you and this rinky dink shop off this plane of existence. Naruto raised a single eyebrow as he stared down at the ball of energy aimed at his throat. Connected to the ball of energy was the arm of a very agitated Valley Lucifer. After dealing with Barakil and Shemhazi, Naruto had reappeared in the back room of the shop only to be confronted by the irritated teen. The devil had immediately grabbed onto the collar of his shirt and confronted him with the attack. The action came off as surprising to the blonde. 
Seems like the boy has some connection with the fallen angels. How shocking. Kurama commented as Naruto continued his stare down with the devil. The blonde's face was set in an amused smirk as he started to address the teen. You know it's illegal to threaten your boss in your workplace. I'm pretty sure it's illegal to do it anywhere else either but especially in your workplace. Naruto stated. Valley released a loud growl at the flippant comment before thrusting his attack forward. To the devil's disappointment and the blonde's amusement, the devil's attack fizzled out of existence as soon as it got within inches of Naruto's face. Naruto couldn't help but chuckle at his fellow teen's confused look. Do you really think I would just allow someone to attack me in my own store? Valley didn't get a chance to reply to the blonde's question as he was forced to undergo the same treatment Barakil and Shemhazai had just underwent. Without even prompting the devil, Naruto had used the Hyerushin to transport him away. Valis sucked in a large, labored breath as his ability to breathe returned to him. During the actual technique, the boy had been left breathless as his body rocketed through through dimensions. The experience was certainly something he didn't want to experience again. Whenever you manage to catch your breath, we can start talking. Valley was vaguely aware of the blonde's comment as he tried to get his stomach back under his control. The devil felt as if he was seconds away from throwing up his lunch, breakfast and last night's dinner. The sense of nausea just didn't seem to want to go away. It was only after a few long and nausea-filled minutes that Valley was able to climb up to his feet. The devil immediately noticed that he was no longer present in the blonde's shop. The environment he was in now was vastly different from the shop with an entire forest's worth of trees surrounding him. Have you caught your breath? Vala's head shot up as the sound of Naruto's voice came from above him. The devil found his boss hanging from the underside of one of the tree branches without the use of his hands. The blonde was simply just sticking to the branch. Shut your mouth. Vala growled out as he took in the trees around him. Naruto shook his head at the devil's question before cutting the flow of chakra to his feet, his feet landing on the forest's floor several seconds later. The shinobi stood over the kneeling teen, his foot tapping the ground repeatedly as he began to speak. Since you don't seem to want to start talking, let me start by asking some questions. Are you a devil or a fallen angel? I sense some demonic energy in your attacks yet you associate yourself with Azazel so I'm not entirely sure. Naruto asked. The blonde got his response in the form of an attack as Valis swiped at his chest. The devil was unsuccessful in his attempt as Naruto managed to jump out of range of the teen strike. Valley quickly climbed onto his feet before taking off towards Naruto. The blonde stood still as the devil ran full speed at him. The teen's speed was impressive yet nowhere close to the type he had been forced to face during his own time as a shinobi. The devil closed the distance between the two within an instance. He started off his assault by throwing a quick jab at Naruto's head. The blonde ducked his head to the side avoiding the blow while sending his own punch at the teen. The devil swiped away the shinobi's punch before headbutting the blonde, an unexpected move that caught Naruto by surprise as he was sent stumbling backwards. Albion, come forth. Valley yelled while Naruto stumbled backwards. Within the blink of an eye, a pair of glistening blue wings appeared from the teen's shoulder blade. The wings were reminiscent of a bat as the devil quickly took to the skies. Divide. The devil declared from his aerial position. At the same moment, Naruto, who had since recovered from the headbutt, felt his chakra be cut in half. Now, unfortunately for Valley, Naruto was used to having his chakra literally be split in half. After all, that was the basis behind his signature move, the Shadow Clone Jutsu. So when Devil's Divine Divide came into effect, the shinobi wasn't phased one bit. This showed as Naruto was able to send himself launching towards the airborne devil. Valley, who had been expected some type of visible response from the blonde, hesitated momentarily, an act that would cost him as Naruto appeared above him and landed a heavy haymaker against the teen's cheek. The force behind the blow sent the young devil-human hybrid spiraling through the air while Naruto descended back down to the ground. With the usage of his wings, Valley quickly managed to recover from the punch. The devil wasn't given much rest as several came flashing towards him. The devil was forced to fly even higher into the air in order to dodge the projectiles. Divide! Valley yelled as he flew higher into the air. He felt a large mass of energy flow into his body, yet the blonde showed no visible reaction as he continued to send Kanai after Kanai towards the flying devil. Why the hell isn't it working? The teen didn't have much time to ponder the answer as a Kanai nicked his midsection, causing him to stumble in his flight. Valley paid for the mishap as several more Kanai sliced into his body. 
Idiot, it is working. If you haven't noticed, your wings are the brightest they have ever been. The child just has so much energy that taking half of it doesn't seem to affect him. Vali glanced down to his wings at his partner's words. To his surprise, he was actually forced to cover his eyes as the light coming from his wings were too bright for his own eyes. Never take your eyes off an opponent. Vali managed to hear the blonde shout before a bullet of air struck him in the stomach. The team was sent spiraling back towards the ground where his face was greeted with the hard and unforgiving forest floor. He really doesn't want to give up. Reminds me of myself a bit. The blonde mused as he watched the devil attempt to climb back up to his feet immediately after his fall. Not many people would even try to get back after being kicked out of the sky by him. It was somewhat admirable. Unfortunately for the devil, he wouldn't get much of a chance to fight back as Naruto threw several more kunai his way. The bladed weapons landed in a square-like formation around the downed teen. Unlike before, these kunais had several small paper tags wrapped around their handles. The nature of the tags became clear as a blue barrier erected itself around the silverette with the kunai serving as the corner points of the barrier. Wonder how you plan on getting yourself out of this one? Albion said as he observed the barrier from his container's point of view. Valley paid the dragon no attention as he once again climbed up to his feet. The barrier surrounding him allowed him enough room to take a couple steps in each direction but it wasn't much. The devil took several tentative steps towards the barrier before slowly reaching out towards it. As soon as his fingers made contact with the barrier they began to singe, causing the boy to release a loud hiss while retracting his arm. I promise you, you won't be able to force yourself out of that without missing a few body parts. So why don't you just sit back, relax and start talking? The blonde drawled out in a casual manner as he took a seat in front of the restrained devil. I advise that you actually listen to him. He is able to resist our divide and we have no idea the strength of this barrier. Lull him into a sense of security and convince him to release us then we can move accordingly. Albion's voice echoed in Vala's head as the boy continued to glance in between the sitting blonde and the barrier. The devil contemplated his partner's words and the current situation he was in. From the blonde's demeanor, he didn't seem to be in a rush at all which worried the devil. Confidence in this world meant one of two things, a large amount of strength and technique or an overwhelming sense of arrogance. And considering the way the blonde had knocked him out the sky and trapped him in this barrier, he was going to assume the blonde possessed the former. Vala sighed as he climbed to his hands and feet. He quickly transitioned to a sitting position before meeting eyes with Naruto. The blonde expression was still set in a bored mask as his eyes drilled into the devil. Vala met the shinobi's eyes as he began to speak. Fine, you want me to talk? I'll talk. Get comfortable though, this will take a while. The sound of a door slamming shut announced Naruto's return to his home. The blonde's subsequent sigh and groan further pronounced this fact as the boy immediately trudged towards his kitchen. His talk with Vali had been rather, interesting. The first thing he had noticed was that the boy was a crappy liar. Everything out of his mouth was either half-truths or just complete lies. He couldn't exactly blame the devil, after all, he would have behaved the same way if someone was forcibly interrogating him. The devil had given him the bare minimum of his backstory. He claimed to have been of devil descent and had no fallen angel blood within him. The teen claimed to be Azazel's protege, a fact which seemed to add up pretty well considering the apparent closeness between the duo. The devil had also explained to him who exactly Barakil and Shemhazai. When it was revealed that the two fallen angels were actually the right-hand men to Azazel, he had been taken by surprise. The two, even Shemhazai, had seemed much more competent than the perverted fallen angel though he had yet to test either of the three in full combat. If what the devil was saying was true, he was pretty lucky he managed to catch them off guard with Hiration. The duo could have done plenty of damage to his shop and his customers. In the end, he had decided to allow the boy to go. He had even made sure to let the devil know that he was still welcome to work here. He seriously doubted that Valley would actually accept the offer but he was still going to put it out there. I'm going to have to start adding more security seals to the shop since all these people know about it now. He released a groan as he thought of all the extra work he was going to have to put into his store. He decided he would let future Naruto deal with that. At the moment, all he wanted to focus on was a big bowl of ramen. The shinobi went to unseal his cabinet, but was stopped when he heard the subtle sound of footsteps coming from behind him. He couldn't help but want to sigh as the footsteps came closer and closer to him. I thought you were finished with the assassination attempts. Naruto said as he turned to face a stealthy Kuroka. 
The Nekashu was dressed in her usual outfit and stood frozen in a pose that a child would make if they were caught sneaking around. The look on the woman's face would have been pretty amusing to the blonde if Kuroka also didn't have a kitchen knife in her hand. I have no idea what you're talking about. The woman's words would have came off as convincing if she hadn't blatantly threw the knife away from herself in an attempt to hide her own guilt in the process. Naruto rolled his eyes at the Nekashu before turning back around to prepare his ramen. His and Kuroka relationship had since evolved from their initial meeting of each other. Now don't get him wrong, Naruto knew that the moment he released the seal around the Nekashu's neck, she would probably attempt to slit his throat but she had become a lot less spiteful in her action and speakings towards him. She had actually admitted to enjoy the consistency of their arrangement. As he long as he brought her home some sweets and dealt with her teasing, she would be satisfied. For now, I can't really smell Shiro-chan on you today yet you reek of fallen angel. Are you neglecting my little sister again? The woman's voice was filled with mock anger as she attempted to turn the subject away from her mock assassination attempt. Naruto waved off the devil's comment as he set the pot of water down on his stove top to boil. She had to do stuff with her peerage tonight. We're actually going on a date tomorrow so you can stop it with the me being a neglectful boyfriend act. Naruto commented as he dumped the contents of the ramen packet into the boiling water. Kuroka hummed thoughtfully to herself before a sly smirk suddenly made its way to her face. The smirk only seemed to grow as the girl slowly approached the unsuspecting blonde. So, have you and Kaneko done it yet? Kuroka had to hold in a giggle as she watched the blonde freeze up at her words. Within a second, the teen was now facing her with a large blush staining his cheeks. What type of question is that? You can't just ask stuff like that out of the blue. The boy's voice had raised an octave higher as his embarrassment leaked into his voice. The higher pitch served to amuse the Nekashu as she released a giggle before slinking even closer to Naruto. If it involves my sister, I have the right to know. Now answer my question, Naya. Have you and Shiron done it yet? If you have, I hope you were gentle with my little sister. She isn't built as tough as tough as me. She emphasized her point by running her hands over her clothed body. That action, along with the woman's line of questioning, officially stunned the blonde as he started to stutter. Why you? I. You can't just. Ah. Uh. The shinobi, knowing that he had already lost the verbal confrontation with the woman, decided to just groan and turn away from her to save face. There's was no point in continuing to face Kuroka if all he was going to do was embarrass himself even more. Just promise me you'll make me their godmother when they eventually pop out. I would do absolutely anything if you let me name one of them. Kuroka made sure her breasts were pressed fully against the boy's backside as she talked. It seemed the combination of her words and actions were too much for Naruto as the teen disappeared from the kitchen in a swirl of wind and leaves, leaving an amused Kuroka alone with his ramen. Chapter 17 And, warning, while this chapter definitely pushes the plot of the story further forward, there is a bunch of fluff. So if you find yourself allergic to fluff, feel free to skip over those parts. Enjoy the chapter. Bring them in. Michael's voice resonated throughout his massive office. The angel standing by the entrance gave the seraph a simple nod before opening the doors to the office. In came walking two females. By any standards, the two young girls could be considered beautiful and the clothes they wore only accented that fact. Their attire consisted of black, skin-tight unitard that stopped right at thigh level. They both wore fingerless glove that extended almost the entire length of their arms. The more sedate of the duo had chin-length blue hair that clashed beautifully with her bright, yellow eyes. The girl's stature was upright and stiff as a white, hooded cloak hung from her shoulder. Strapped to her back was a massive broadsword that had a blue blade and a golden edge. The other girl seemed to be her polar opposite of her partner. She had dark, chestnut-colored hair that was styled in twin tails and flowed down her whole back. Her posture was relaxed and carefree as a small smile was plastered across her face. Strapped to her waist was a simple long sword that shone brightly in the well-lit room. Irina and Zenovia. It is very nice to see you both again. I hope that you two are doing well. Michael started off the conversation in a friendly manner. He knew exactly the gravity of the mission he was about to assign the duo and felt that it was best to ease them into the situation. Zenovia responded with a simple nod of her head, her respect for man stopping her from giving a verbal response. Since birth, she had been trained under the teaching of exorcists, religious figureheads and angels. 
The level of respect and admiration she held for Michael and the other angels was unfathomable. Irina, on the other hand, had no qualms in verbally responding to the man. Similar to Zenovia, she had grown up under a very strict Christian background. Since birth, she had been taught about respecting the Lord and his followers. She just had a hard time restraining herself at times. She was the very definition of a devout Christian. Anyone who mocked her religion faced her wrath. I'm doing fantastic, Michael Sama. I always love coming to heaven. Everyone here is just so nice and the air is fresh and everything is amazing. The girl spouted out, earning a slight chuckle from the seraph and his standing guard. Zenovia didn't seem to find the behavior as fun as an annoyed look crossed the young woman's face. She managed to hold back in reprimanding her partner since she was in the presence of one of her idols. She would just wait until later. That's good to hear. I'm glad that you two are doing so well. It warms my heart that two of our best exorcists are continuing to excel out in the field. In all honesty, Michael almost felt bad at the happy feelings washing out from the two girls. He honestly hated having to manipulate the two like this, but it had to be done. Now I bet you two have been wondering why exactly I called you up here. Most people don't get the privilege of stepping foot in any part of heaven after all. Michael gave a deliberate pause in order to set the gravity of the situation. The pause was purposeful and its purpose was to emphasize the privilege the girls had been given. Receiving some type of special privilege from one of their idols would undoubtedly make the duo ecstatic. Just as Michael assumed, a wave of excitement coursed through the church duo. Up until this point, they hadn't fully taken in the fact that they had an audience that consisted of one of God's children. And this very same man was complimenting them. Now I'm going to be frank with you girls. I know that you are aware of the recent theft of the Excalibur fragments. Up until recently, we weren't sure of the culprit and their location but we have finally managed to track him down. The culprit is a former brother of mine named Kokabil. The name dropped by the seraph elicited a gasp from both of the girls. Everyone who read the Bible knew who Kokabil was. One of God's earlier creations, the angel had vast potential in his youth. He was spirited, vivacious and motivated as a child. He could always be found tailing one of the archangels in hopes of receiving lessons from them. All of that changed before the Great War. No one was certain how or why but the angel fell to his sins. One day he had been amongst the greatest in God's youthful ranks and the next day his wings had turned pitch black as he succumbed to his sins. Kokabil had been a major figure for the fallen angels during the Great War. The youthful man had turned to a bloodthirsty psychopath on the battlefield. The fallen angel loved war. He practically bathed in the blood of his enemies during battle. Even his own comrades seemed to be frightened of him at times. The fallen angel seemed to have fallen out of relevancy once the Great War ended. To hear that he was the person who had been taking the sword fragments was fairly alarming. Kokabil has stolen three of the seven remaining fragments of Excalibur. We have managed to locate his current base of operation in Kuo. Kuo is a devil-controlled territory which is the only reason we aren't sending a much larger force there. Instead, we are sending you two to infiltrate Kuo, retrieve the Excalibur fragments and, if possible, find some way to sabotage any Kokabil may have in store. We believe he is working outside the realm of Azazel's orders but if you manage to discover otherwise, please make sure to collect evidence as such. Michael finished. The man's joyful tone had quickly faded away during his assignment of the mission. The two girls in front of him seemed to pick up on the mood as even Irina straightened up and seemed to be paying more attention. There is also another issue in Kuo I need you two to attend to. The girls perked up as Michael continued his speech. There is an entity there that has caught our attention. Here is a picture of him and his base. Michael opened up on the drawers to his desk and took out two pictures. He handed each girl a single picture and allowed them time to view it. He's cute slash is this a candy shop? Were the varying reactions from the duo. Behind them, Michael's guard released a short chuckle but was quickly silenced by a sharp glance from the seraph. To answer your question, yes that is a candy shop. The boy in the picture is the owner and the target in question. For right now, I simply wish for you two to observe them during your mission. He is extremely dangerous. For your own safety, do not engage in any manner and for the love of our Lord, do not let him know I send you. Michael said, earning him another set of nods from the girl. A sigh of relief left the man's mouth as his happy disposition seemed to return to him. Good. That is all girls. 
I wish you both the best of luck and await your return. God bless both of you. Michael cheerfully said. A wide smile popped up on Irina's face and even Zenovia had a small smile on her face at the man's cheery nature. They both offered him a low bow before being led out of the office. Do you think it was wise to send them into devil territory? Michael released a small sigh before spinning in his seat. Standing behind him was a smiling Gabriel who looked as beautiful and elegant as ever. Do you always eavesdrop in my meetings? The man asked his sister. She offered her brother a nonchalant shrug before walking forward and taking a seat on his desk, earning her a mock glare from him. She waved off the look before prompting him to continue to talk. Math. Just answer the question. Michael rolled his eyes at the immature response before slumping down into his seat. Do I think it was wise? No. Not really. Was it necessary? Absolutely. I'm not stupid. I know exactly what Kokabil is doing. He has no need for Excalibur. He is simply attempting to goad me into responding harshly which would incite war. Sending those two is the best way to deal with the situation. Michael commented as Gabriel childishly swung her legs back and forth. The woman released a small hum before swinging her legs onto her brother desks, knocking off a multitude of papers and earning herself another glare from the man. What about telling them to spy on our little friend? Gabriel asked. Michael quickly lifted the woman's legs from off his desk before responding. I didn't tell anyone to spy on anyone. I simply told them to keep an eye on him. Michael's response earned him an incredulous look from his sister which he promptly ignored. You're a terrible liar, Michael. You're a terrible everything, Gabriel. If you put that dress near me one more time, I promise I'll rip it to shreds. Kaneko's low and leveled voice carried through the entirety of the club room. The young girl was sat in her usual place on the couch and sat right beside was her king who had a yellow sundress in her hands. But you're going on a date. Don't you want to look nice? Rias questioned while dangling the sundress in what the redhead assumed to be an enticing manner. The sundress was quickly torn away from her grip, eliciting a yelp from the redhead. The gremory had to watch as the sundress was shred to pieces by the rook's claws. The dress was promptly thrown back in the older girl's face much to the amusement of the other devils in the room. If Kaneko doesn't want to dress up for her date, I think we should respect her decision, Ria-sama. Akino commented from her position across the room. The girl's words were lost on her king since all of Ria's attention was focused on the torn dress. This dress cost me so much money and she just ripped it up. The girl muttered while holding the remnants of the sundress. Kaneko shook her head at the girl's overdramatic behavior while pushing herself off the couch. Where are you headed, Kaneko-san? Kiba asked from his position in the corner of the room as Kaneko walked to the door of the club room. From the corner of his eye, he could see Issei slowly making his over to Rias in order to comfort the girl. My date. Were the girl's parting words as the door slammed behind her. Kiba offered her a small nod before redirecting his attention back on his king. The girl was still knelt on the couch while Issei was now sat beside her while awkwardly attempting to comfort her. The boy's attempts were obviously failing if the girl's far-off look and mumbling were anything to go by. I did so much begging to my brother. The things I had to say were some of the few words that were coming from the girl's mouth. Kiba shook his head at the girl's overdramatic behavior before pushing himself off the wall he was leaned against. Looks like he would have to fix this issue. Again, night had quickly settled over the town of Kuo. It was Friday so the weekend, night activities were in full swing. Lights from varying shops, stores and restaurants could be seen from far away. In one of these restaurants was a rather interesting looking couple. The male looked to be over a foot taller than the female even while they were sat at their table. His cheerful, almost sunny disposition seemed to be stark contrast to the girl's sedated and shy demeanor. I don't know why you took me to such a fancy place Kaneko murmured out as she took a glance at her surroundings. To say that the restaurant they were in was expensive would be a massive understatement. One could gauge that just by the attire of the other occupants. Most were dressed in intricate kimonos adorned with different patterns and designs. Waiters dressed in fancy suits ran back and forth while dropping off varying sizes of platters filled with food. Well I thought it was time for us to spend some time outside of my shop or the middle of the forest. Plus I heard this place has amazing sushi. Naruto commented while smirking at his girlfriend. Just by her reaction, he could tell the girl was feeling some embarrassment due to their current situation. 
The duo stood out immensely from everyone else in the restaurant. Naruto was dressed in a simple, white dress shirt that went well with the black suit pants he had on. Compared to the other males in restaurant, he looked like a delinquent with his wild hair and casual clothes. Kaneko was dressed in her usual school attire and was currently regretting not taking Rias up on her offer for the sundress. At least she wouldn't be getting all these weird looks from the other couples. I figured. I just. Kaneko trailed off as her eyes slid over to Naruto. Unlike herself, the blonde seemed to have no problem with their current attire. He had on the same natural, carefree smile that he always seemed to have. The stares the duo were receiving didn't seem to be bothering him one bit. Hmm. <clears throat> Naruto questioned, snapping Kaneko out of her thoughts. Her eyes made their way up to Naruto's and saw that there was now a spark of concern in them. Internally, Kaneko sighed to herself. Sometime it was hard having a boyfriend that cared so much. It made it hard for her to be mad at him. It's nothing. She mumbled while slinking down into her chair. It was unfair that she couldn't be angry at him. Excuse me sir and ma'am. Both Naruto and Kaneko looked up and saw a waiter standing at the edge of their table with a tray of food in hand. A look of confusion crossed Kaneko's face as she realized that they have never ordered. Naruto, on the other hand, was attempting to hold in a chuckle at the adorably confused plastered across his girlfriend's face. You can set it down. Thank you. Naruto said, prompting the waiter to give a short bow of his head before setting down the tray. Now that the food was on table, Kaneko was able to get a good look at it. And boy did it look delicious. Row upon row of sushi sat in front of the young girl. Everything from tempura rolls to sashimi to dragon rolls were sat neatly in front of her with a large bowl of soy sauce placed gingerly to the side. A single pair of chopsticks were wrapped neatly and placed in front of a smug Naruto. So, much. All of these are my favorites. Kaneko mumbled as her eyes glided over the enormous amount of seafood in front of her. She couldn't spot a single dish that she hadn't tasted before and absolutely loved. The devil was snapped out of her trance by the sound of chopsticks breaking apart. She tore her eyes away from the sushi in order to look up at Naruto who was holding the only set of the wooden utensils. Just then, the realization that there was only one pair of chopsticks struck Kaneko. Why is there only one set? Kaneko questioned as Naruto reached down with the chopsticks and picked up a particularly tasty looking tempura roll. I'm going to feed you, of course. I spent all day tasting and sampling sweets. I don't really need to eat. Now open up. Naruto said while moving the piece of sushi towards Kaneko's mouth. She immediately moved her backwards while looking around the restaurant once again in order to see if anyone was watching the exchange. I. I can feed myself though. She said as blood rushed to her cheeks. In all honesty, she absolutely loved being fed by the blonde. It was one of her favorite daily activities. But, with them being in this restaurant surrounded by other couples, she wasn't really up to it right now. Naruto rolled his eyes at the girl's reluctance before abruptly standing up from his seat, catching the attention of several people around them. The blonde made his way around the table to Kaneko's side before taking the seat next to her, his hand still holding onto the chopstick with the sushi. I know that you can feed yourself but do you really want to feed yourself? Naruto asked while enticingly dangling the piece of sushi in front of the girl's face. Kaneko's eyes instinctively locked onto the seafood as drool started to pool in her mouth. Unconsciously, her head began to slowly move towards the sushi. Just as her mouth was inches away from the chopsticks, Kaneko seemed to snap out of her trance as she quickly moved back from Naruto and the sushi. There are people around. She mumbled to herself as she lowered her head. The girl was forced to look back up as Naruto gently took hold of her chin and turned her head upwards. Her eyes met with Naruto's. If you think I really care about these people around us then you are very wrong. I like feeding my girlfriend food and my girlfriend likes it when I feed her food so I'm going to feed her food no matter what other people think about it, believe it. Naruto's loud outburst caught the attention of everyone around them. The blonde didn't seem to care much as his eyes stayed locked onto Kaneko. Now, are we going to sit here and have an awkward date because of other people or are you going to open your mouth so I can gently shove sushi in it? The blonde asked with the utmost seriousness in his voice even with the ridiculousness of what he just said. The boy's voice was loud enough for others to hear it as well as the couple was receiving even more crazy looks. None of this seemed to bother Naruto whatsoever as his eyes stayed solely locked onto Kaneko. Well? 
Naruto asked again when he received no answer from the shocked girl. The boy's second question seemed to snap Kaneko out of her slight daze as she began to take notice of all the looks the two were receiving. Her eyes eventually made their way back to Naruto and the piece of sushi as the blonde awaited her answer. The teen received his answer in the form of Kaneko slowly opening her mouth, much to the blonde's joy. He slowly glided the piece of sushi into the girl's mouth and allowed her to consume the food. He happily retracted the chopsticks from the girl's mouth before quickly picking up another piece of sushi. Are you going to do this for every piece? Kaneko mumbled before opening her mouth once again, giving Naruto the opportunity to slip another piece of seafood into the girl's mouth. Inwardly, the devil wanted to feel some type of agitation at her boyfriend's stubbornness. Not only had he completely ignored her protests, he had also forcibly fed her food. But could she truly be angry when he was being so sweet? Her taste buds and the warm feeling in her chest were currently telling her that the answer to that question was no. And with each piece of sushi, she was finding it harder and harder to go against them. Yes I am. So you can either suck it up and freely enjoy the nice food or I could tie you to a chair and make you enjoy the nice food. Your choice. Naruto casually said while offering Kaneko another piece of food. The girl's eyes traveled in between the sushi and the blonde before she chose the obviously better decision and opened her mouth. Naruto seemed happy to slide yet another piece of food into her mouth before allowing her time to eat it. Seemed like tonight was going to be a long night. I can't believe you got us kicked out. Kaneko commented as Naruto and her made their way down an empty Ko street while holding hands. It was now much later in the night and the streets were completely deserted. The only light being provided were several dim street lights. It wasn't my fault. What type of place doesn't allow couples to share plates? I spent all day working and I'm not allowed to have one piece of the sushi that I bought. That's ridiculous. That waiter better be happy I didn't raise and gan his ass for being so rude. The teen grumbled out. Only five minutes prior, the duo had been merrily sat in the restaurant with Kaneko happily munching away on sushi. The girl had very quickly gotten over the initial embarrassment of being fed in front of a bunch of strangers and was simply enjoying the food. She had actually managed to convince Naruto to take a piece for himself since the guilt of just eating all of the food was starting to eat away at her. Unfortunately for the two, a pesky waiter seemed to have been keeping a very close eye on the two and swooped in to remind Naruto of the restaurant's no-sharing policy. Being the person he was, Naruto didn't take the warning so well. In fact, he had taken it the exact opposite. After much arguing, yelling and sushi throwing, Naruto and Kaneko had escorted themselves out of the place. That process consisted of Naruto picking Kaneko up, throwing the girl over his shoulder, yelling I make candy sushi that tastes better than his crap before charging out of the restaurant. Uptight assholes. Can't share food my ass. I'll share as much food as I want. The blonde grumbled beneath his breath as he continued to stomp his way down the street while holding Kaneko's hand. The blonde was so wrapped up in his frustration that he missed Kaneko attempting to hold back a smirk at his behavior. I'm going to make it my goal to put those bastards out of business. They will read Naruto was interrupted in his ranting when he felt a sharp tug on his hand. He looked down at Kaneko and saw that the devil was now sending him a rather expectant look. It didn't take him long to get the meaning behind the look as he quickly released her hand and prepared himself. Not even a second later, he felt Kaneko land against his back. His arms instinctively went back and found their way around the girl's thigh, securing her in place. He could already feel the girl snuggling into his back as he continued his journey down the street. Stop worrying about stupid restaurants and walk me home. Kaneko's muffled voice came from behind him. Even though she couldn't see it, the Nekashu got a roll of the eyes in response. Can I at least get a please? Naruto sarcastically asked. The blonde was taken off guard when he felt something lightly wrap around waist. He felt Kaneko's grip on his body tighten as a light purr began to emit from the girl. Narukuen, can you please take me home? I'm too tired to walk. You tired me out today Kaneko's voice had taken on a deceptively deeper tone as she tried her very best to imitate a tired voice in order to fluster the boy. The usage of her tail was just a backup in case Naruto didn't fall for it. Going by the sudden stiffening and sputtering coming from the shinobi, the girl's strategy seemed to walk. A smug smirk made its way to her face as she imagined the blush and thoughts running through the blonde's head. What happened to me quiet and shy Kaneko who used to ask for piggyback rides and not making me blush? Naruto mumbled in mock frustration. 
Kaneko softly giggled at the blonde's comment before wrapping her tail tighter around his waist. Your personality started to rub off on her. Now stop complaining and take me home. Naruto released a mock grumble at the girl's response before tightening his grip on her thighs and picking up his pace. He had created a monster and now he had to deal with it. Looks like Heracles has finally returned, ciao. A pair of light green eyes lazily fluttered open as the announcement rung throughout the room. The room in question was rather Spartan-esque in designs. The walls were painted a dark black and was surrounding in red trimmings. Hung up on the walls were a few different paintings that depicted different landscapes. Sat directly in the center of the room was a medium-sized desk that was currently being occupied. The man occupying the desk could best be described as a handsome youth with short black hair. He was dressed in button-down shirt that was reminiscent of Chinese school attire. Around his waist, an intricate jacket was secured by a large black belt. One hand was holding up the man's head while the other's fingers were steadily drumming on the table. Oh really? Ophis must have grown tired of him. Tell him he can come in, George. Chow Chow said as he sat upright in his chair. Several weeks ago, the dragon god had suddenly requested to borrow the Greek descendant. The tone of the message made it clear that there would be no compromising with the dragon so Chow ordered Heracles off. He honestly didn't know nor cared what the girl wanted with the man. George gave his partner a small nod before pushing open the doors of the office. The sight that greeted the two men actually managed to take them off guard. Standing in the frame of the door was an obviously damaged Heracles. The man looked to be on his last leg. Every single one of his veins were visible and seemed to be pulsating with a sickly, gray light. Parts of his body was covered in cuts and bruises that were caked in dirt. The man's usual clothing was gone and was replaced with a shirt and a pair of pants that looked several sizes too small for him. His signature club was nowhere in sight. You're looking worse for wear. Chow commented as the Greek hobbled into the room. The man didn't seem to be too amused by the comment as he shot a glare at the faction leader. Shut your damn mouth, Chow. You have no idea what type of hell that bitch of a dragon has put me through. Hercules growled out as he stood in front of the desk. Chow raised a single eyebrow at the man's outburst before leaning back into his chair. Feel free to try and explain your plight to me. I'm all ears. Chow said, prompting Hercules to start the retelling of his experiences. Chow listened intently as the man explained Ophis, poisoning him, with her powers. That part had been rather interesting to him considering what he had planned for the dragon. To hear that the god's powers were poisonous to the man was slightly worrying but he was sure he would find a way around that. Another thing that interested the man was the blonde that Hercules had been tasked with defeating. The Greek had been rather bitter during his retelling of his battles with the shinobi. From what Chow could glean from the man's recounting, the battles had been rather one-sided and embarrassing. But the part that had caught his attention was the Greek's persistence that the boy he faced was human. I'm telling you he was a human. I didn't sense a single ounce of supernatural energy coming from him during our fights. I wouldn't lose to some mythical freak. Hercules insisted as he attempted to save the last remnants of his pride. In front of him, Chow sat silently laid back in his chair, seemingly taking in everything that had been said. This, is all rather interesting. Go get yourself patched up. I'll deal with Ophis. Hercules didn't even bother to respond to the man as he promptly turned and left the office. George closed the door as the soon as the man went stomping by before turning to gauge the man's reaction. Well? George articulated after several moments of silence. Very slowly, a grin began to work its way onto the man's face as he stood from his desk. Well, it looks like we have another piece added to our chess game. Time to see if he is playing for our side or the other. Chapter 18 Is this information accurate? A guttural voice sounded out from within the dark confines of the chamber. To say the room was pitch black would be a massive understatement. Not a single photon of light seemed to be able to find its way into the room. Yet its two occupants seemed to have no trouble conversing in it. Yes. The two have been spotted along the outskirts of Kuo. We've had several of our agents tracking them but they seem to alone. Our SCO, the second voice was quickly silenced as wet squelching noise filled the air. The squelching turned into a wet gurgling sound as a loud thump quickly accompanied it. The gurgling continued for close to a full minute before it died away. Should have figured he wouldn't fall for the bait. That man is no idiot. The remaining voice spoke as a soft, creaking sound filled the dark chamber. 
The slow sound of footsteps echoed throughout the room as a small amount of light began to seep into the room. Well, if he won't start a war, I'll be happy to start one for him. And I'll start by showing Sir Zex and Michael just how powerful the fallen angels have become. The voice proclaimed as the light grew stronger and stronger. The light finally grew strong enough for the owner of the voice to be revealed. The man had a sickly pale tone that almost seemed to glow in the dim light that had seeped into the room. He possessed long, silky black hair that flowed down and past his shoulders. His red eyes and pointy ears gave him a very impish appearance. Five pairs of black wings extended from his shoulder blades. The light that had crept into the room also revealed what exactly had happened to the owner of the other voice. The man could be seen collapsed onto his knees on the ground. His hands were up to his neck as the pained expression that was now eternally etched on his face spoke of the pain he felt during his last living moments. A large size hole that was slowly leaking minutes amount of blood seemed to be the cause of the man's death and suffering. If Azazel refuses to abide by my plans then so be it. I will carry them out myself. Both the Gremory and Citri are mistaken if they think their children are protected within this city. I will show just how dangerous the fallen can be. The man commented before allowing his wings to stretch out behind him. Tell Galilei and Freed to prepare their holy swords. We have devils to slay. The man seemingly said to no one. Obviously someone must have been listening as the sound of wings quickly followed the man's words. With his order seemingly being taken care of, the fallen angel gave one last long at the corpse at his feet before a large, light spear appeared within his hand. With a single flick of his wrist, the spear buried into the the man's chest, completely incinerating the body on contact. Trash. I don't need weaklings by my side in this war. Valley. I need you to clean up that mess by table six. Naruto's cheerful voice rang throughout the shop. Standing by the counter, one Vala Lucifer let out an agitated sigh before grabbing the mop leaning against the wall next to him. Anyone that knew Valley and what exactly he had been through in the past two weeks would be interested why exactly he was back in Naruto's shop. After the blonde soundly beat him into the ground and then interrogated, one would expect him to stay as far away as possible from him and his shop. But instead, we find him with an apron wrapped around his waist and a mop in his hand. To be completely honest, the devil had no wish to be here. His pride had been wounded by his defeat and being close to the person that handed it to him definitely wasn't helping the healing process. But unfortunately, he didn't really have many options at this point. Azazel had, cut him off. As much as it pained for the team to admit it, his source of resources solely relied on the fallen angel up until a week ago. When he had returned to the Grigori headquarters after his defeat, he had stormed to Azazel's office to vent his frustrations. His venting was greeted with the mocking laughter of the fallen angel general, much to the devil's frustration. It was when he was a step away from storming out of the man's office due to his anger did Azazel reveal to him his retraction of the Grigori's funds. The fallen angel's excuse had been that he wanted the devil to learn responsibility and initiative from working a real job. The devil had tried to argue against the man but Azazel's stubbornness wouldn't allow it. So with all the resentment in the world, he had to drag himself back to the stupid blonde's shop and ask for his job back. The shinobi had seemed almost too exuberant when he welcomed him back by handing him an apron and a mop. When asked why exactly he needed an apron when wouldn't even be working on the food, Naruto gave him a response in a small shrug and a smile. Valley. The ice cream is starting to melt on the floor. Melted ice cream doesn't smell good when you let it sit for a while. Get to it. The devil was snapped out of his thoughts by the joy-filled voice of his boss. Internally, he had to hold back his urge to blow the blonde and the shop off the face of the planet before eventually making his way over towards the spilled ice cream and the apologetic-looking couple. From behind the counter, Naruto was trying his best to hold back his laughter at the barely muted mumbling of his only employ. Ever since the boy had come back to work for him, his favorite activity had been to annoy the devil every single day. He had no idea why but the boy's responses were just too funny to him. It's probably because you've suffered so much from being the butt of every joke back in the old world. Kurama commented thus ending Naruto's good mood. The blonde smile slipped from his face as his shoulders slumped. You always manage to ruin my good moods. Naruto thought to his partner before instantly straightening up as two more people entered the shop. Zenovia, I don't think actually going into the shop is a good idea. Inwardly, Irina was cursing herself for allowing the situation to even get this far. It was because of her inability to combat the stubbornness of her partner that their mission could be coming to a quick close. 
The two exorcists were currently standing by the entrance of Naruto's shop, dressed in their usual attire. To say that they stood out amongst the other sidewalk occupants would be a massive understatement. Out in public, Irina was starting to become very aware of the spandex that made up her battle suit. Zenobia, on the other hand, didn't seem to have any of the reprehensions that her partner had. The girl stood confidently outside of Naruto's ship, her cloak hanging loosely from her shoulders while her hand rested on the cloth wrapping surrounding her sword. Nonsense. How do you expect us to observe our target if he is not within our sights? The stubborn exorcist commented while taking a glance within the shop window. Within the building, their blonde target seemed to shouting orders to the only other employee within the shop. The boy receiving the orders didn't seem to be enjoying it if his annoyed expression was anything to go by. Why don't we go attempt to find Kokobiel's hideout again and come back before closing time to tail him home? Irina suggested. This had been the duo's fifth day with Kuo and they had been having absolutely no luck in finding the fallen angel's base. This brought a lot of frustration to the headstrong and determined Zenobia. She had suggested scouting out their second target's location in order to take a break from finding the fallen angel. Irina had agreed, assuming that the duo would just find some relaxing spot and camp out. That illusion was shattered as she was literally dragged to the shop by her partner. It was only at the front of the shop that she was able to stop Zenobia and herself. We've been searching for that wretch for the past five days. I need a break from tracking his horrid stench. The girl commented while staring into the interior of the shop. Beside her, Irina had to hold in a sigh as her partner's behavior started to attract the attention of some of the other sidewalk goers. But, going in would take away the element of surprise. Plus Michael Sama said we shouldn't let him know that we weren't sent. Irina desperately responded. Once again, her suggestion was denied. Nonsense. Stealth is within our blood. He won't even notice our presence. Now, let us stop this pointless conversation. Our target could be plotting against us this very moment. Zenobia stated before making her way through the shop's door. Irina stared at the retreating form of her partner for several seconds before sighing and following her in. They stand out so much. Naruto thought to himself as the two girls made their way to a corner table. Their outfits were very revealing and attracted the attention of almost everyone in the shop. The blue-haired girl's billowing cape and oversized clothed sword definitely didn't help keep away the stares. The blonde one seemed to be aware of the stares and was trying her best to avoid the looks. The giant sword wielder seemed completely ignorant of the looks she was gaining as she sat down at a table and proceeded to stare directly at the blonde. She's not really that subtle, is she? Karama asked as the girl continued to hold her glare on his container. Naruto nodded in agreement before shrugging and going back to his cooking. The girls weren't bothering him at the moment so he would allow them to stay. Zenobia, please stop staring. He's going to notice us. Irina begged her partner as she held her head down against the table. Immediately after entering the store, Zenobia had stomped her way over to the furthermost table, sat down at a chair and proceeded to stare at their target. The idea of stealth and subtlety were completely lost on the girl. Sometimes she cursed the girl's sheltered upbringing. It made her an amazing Christian and fighter but terrible at almost everything else. You worry too much. Our reconnaissance mission cannot truly be accomplished without careful observation. Our battle suits make us inconspicuous to the average human's eyes as well. We have nothing to fear. Zenobia commented before redirecting her attention back towards Naruto. To her right, Irina released another groan before slamming her head against the table. They were going to fail this mission so hard. Did the wielder of an Excalibur fragment just walk into the candy shop? Albion commented as Valley glanced at the duo out the side of his eye. The devil had been mopping away the ice cream mess when the exorcist duo had come walking into the shop. Their outfits were an absolute dead giveaway to their jobs. The giant sword strapped to her side was an even bigger giveaway. I'm pretty sure she just did. Valley thought back to his partner as he kept his eye on the duo. Exorcist and devils had never been the best of friends. The humans' abilities to wield swords made them a real bane to devil kind. If the duo discovered that he was a devil, he was sure it was going to cause a problem. Luckily, they didn't seem to have noticed him yet. Yeah, it would be such an issue if the two exorcists interrupted your diligent mopping. Albion comment was literally dripping in sarcasm. Valley momentarily froze in his mopping as his grip on the mop increased enough to actually splinter the wood. 
The splintering continued for several seconds before Valet took in a deep breath and continued mopping. Please don't make the situation worse than it already is. I'm pretty sure my boss is already attempting to make each day of my job worse than the day before. What type of partner would I be if I didn't add to your misery? Also, warning. Your boss is walking towards the two exorcists. Vala's eyes zipped over to the shop's counter and saw that his partner was indeed correct as his boss had walked out from behind it. What is this idiot up to now? Vala thought to himself as he began to subtly prepare himself for a fight. Knowing how the blonde could annoy the life out of people, a fight wasn't too bad of an outcome. Oh my lord, he's making his way over here. I told you that we shouldn't have came here. I knew we were going to get caught. Michael Sama is going to be so mad. We should just run for it while we can. Irina frantically whispered as her eyes caught sight of Naruto making his way towards the duo. Earlier, it had seemed that the blonde had no interest in the duo but all of a sudden he had seemed to focus all of his attention on them. Irina wanted to get up and run away immediately but once again, Zenobia had different plans. Calm yourself. Your paranoia is getting the best of you. He is merely walking in this general gar. The girl was forced to cut herself off as Naruto placed himself on a direct path towards their table. By her side, Irina let out a loud groan as the blonde continued to close the distance separating the two groups. Zenovia, he's walking right towards us. We have to leave. Michael Sama told us to not engage in any manner and he's walking right towards us. The girl's franticism only seemed to increase as Naruto grew closer and closer. By her side, Zenovia's eyes were filled with uncertainty as they stared directly into Naruto's. The two had locked eyes only seconds ago yet the stare felt like it lasted an eternity. The power behind his cerulean pair of eyes captivated her attention yet set every single nerve in her body on high alert. She wanted to get lost within those twin pools while also wanting to get as far away as possible from him. I. He. The exorcist was so engrossed in her stare that she couldn't even articulate her thoughts. She began to shake as the conflict ion in her body made her hesitate between grabbing her sword and swinging it at their approaching target or jumping head first through a window and returning to heaven with her tail tucked between her legs. Unfortunately for the duo, neither would get the chance to act as Naruto finally arrived at their table. The whole entire shop seemed to descend in silence as the two groups stared at one another. Zenovia's shaking had increased even more as the urge to run increased within her yet her body refused to act. They look like they're about to piss themselves. Naruto couldn't help but agree as he stared at the two girls. The blue-haired one had her hand on the handle of the sword and looked struck between wanting to cut his head off or take off running. The blonde one refused to even meet his eyes as if he was Lucifer himself. They reek of that energy that was rolling off of that angel you encountered a couple of weeks ago. Most likely they were sent to keep an eye on you. They're doing an absolute horrible job at being stealthy. Kurama commented as Naruto held his gaze on the two girls. The duo had completely froze at this point, seemingly waiting on him to make the first move. And make the first move he did. Hi. You girls have been sitting here for a while and looked a bit hungry. Can I get you anything? Naruto used his patent, hospitable, shop owner voice to speak with the duo. To say that his greeting caught them off guard would be a massive understatement. The shock was palpable on the duo's face. All the fear and anxiety that had built up within the exorcists had instantly faded away at the sound of Naruto's voice. What? Was the only word Irina could articulate in the moment. Just moments ago, she was afraid that this man was going to attempt to rip their heads off. Now he was offering them snacks. What the hell was going on? I'm the owner of the shop, you know. I would sort of look bad if I didn't offer you girls something. I'm pretty sure there's something on the menu that you girls would find tasty. Naruto's face took on a bashful look as he began to rub the back of his head. His statement was once again met with Olish stares from the duo, much to his own amusement. Meanwhile in Zenobia's head, a fierce debate was taking place. The urge to fight or flight had departed her and now the only thing left in its place was confusion. The impression she had gotten from Michael was that the person they were spying on was a threat. Now, she could admit that she had made a rather stupid and headstrong mistake by charging headfirst into his territory but this was definitely not the response she was expecting from an individual dangerous enough to draw the attention of someone like Michael. He must be attempting to lure us into safety with his words before poisoning us. Michael Sama warned us that he was dangerous. It is my mistake for falling into his den but I refuse to be trapped by him. 
I must defend. I will not let his sweet tones seduce my thoughts. Zenobia's value system seemed to kick back in as her expression hardened on Naruto. The blonde was caught off guard as the girl began to slowly draw her sword from its scabbard. Both Irina and Naruto immediately took notice of the action and luckily for the occupants of the restaurant, Irina was the first to act. The girl threw herself across Zenobia's body and slammed her hand down on the pommel of Zenobia's sword, slamming the weapon back down into its scabbard. What in the Lord's name are you doing? Are you trying to get us killed? Irina half whispered and half yelled as she glanced between her partner and the curious looking Naruto. The teen had taken notice of Zenobia's action and had decided to allow her act to see where the situation was heading. Now while seeing Irina stretched across the table holding the girl back while sending worried glances at him, he was pretty happy about his decision. Do not let his words fool you. He only wishes to end us. You heard Michael Sama, he is dangerous. I would be doing heaven a favor by ending him. Zenobia half whispered and half yelled right back at her partner. The girl was straining against Irina in order to draw her sword while her eyes stayed focused in a glare on Naruto. Meanwhile, the blonde was casually standing in front of the struggling duo with a single eyebrow raised at their actions. Shut up before you get us both killed, you idiot. Irina harshly whispered back as she kept glancing in between her partner and the blonde. Zenobia released a growl before shoving her shoulder into her partner, throwing her fellow exorcist away from her as she stood from her seat, drew her sword and leveled the weapon at the blonde. I will smite thee. Zenobia yelled as she stood with her sword pointed at Naruto's chest. By this point, everyone in their shop had their full attention on the altercation going on between the three. Irina was still sat in her seat, her eyes filled with shock and alarm as the situation seemed to spiral farther and farther out of hand. Naruto, on the other hand, looked as casual as ever as he gazed between the sword pointed at his chest and the exorcist. A small smile made its way to the boy's face as he reached behind his back to untie his apron. Fine. I'll give you the chance to smite to me. But let's take this outside. I'm sure you don't want any of these innocent people getting in the way of your smiting. Follow me out back. Naruto said as he finished untying the smock. The boy twisted his body slightly before throwing the apron towards Valley. The garment hit the devil square in the face just as Naruto turned back to face the duo. Valley, take care of the shop for a bit. I have to take care of some business. These girls got me all fired up. The blonde's voice was cheerful as he bounded through the front entrance of his own shop. Zenobia showed no hesitation as she charged after the shinobi with her sword swinging wildly by her side. Irina sat stock still in her seat for several seconds, her mind being too shocked to even comprehend what had just happened. But, as if she had been flipped to autopilot, she eventually climbed to her feet and followed after her partner and their target, leaving behind a shock full of confused customers and a pissed off valley. That idiot thought wrong if he thinks I'm just going to sit here like a dumbass while he is out there fighting. The devil angrily mumbled to himself as he ripped off his own smock, threw it to the ground and went charging after Naruto. Silence your mouth. Zenobia screamed as she brought her sword down upon Naruto. Unfortunately, similarly to what had been occurring for the past five minutes, the shinobi side stepped the girl's swing and allowed the sword to slam into the ground. As soon as the sword made contact with the earth, a massive burst of energy emitted from its blade, creating a massive crater. That's a real interesting sword you have there. Don't think I've seen anything like it before. Naruto commenting as Zenobia stood keeled over, panting harshly as she attempted to catch a hold of her breath. She had been on the offensive for the past five minutes yet had made absolutely no progress. The blonde was terrifyingly quick. It was either that or the boy's reflexes had evolved to such a degree that the amount of time that he was given to react allowed for a lapse in his speed. Either way, she couldn't hit the blonde if her life was dependent on it and it had begun to frustrate her. Irina stood on the rim of the clearing the duo was occupying, her eyes filled with a minute amount of concern for her partner and a huge amount of concern for the status of their mission. They had directly engaged with one of their targets, verbally and now physically, which directly went against Michael's orders. For all they knew, the blonde could be working with Kokabeel and their interactions with him could ruin their whole operation. Why didn't I just stop her? Irina thought to herself as her focus returned to her partner and the blonde. Usually, she would have more concern for her fellow exorcist but it became clear to her within the first minute of the fight that she had no reason to worry. Shoot, if she had to worry about anything, it was worrying about Zenobia overexerting herself. 
The blonde was quick, deadly quick. The boy seemed to react to Zenobia's movement before the girl could even make the moves. For every overextension the exorcist made, the teen could have struck down the exorcist a hundred different ways. For every slip or fall that befell the exorcist, the blonde could have disarmed the girl at least a dozen times. Yet, he did none of that. All he did was dance around the girl's shoddy sword work with a care in the world. It was relieving to know that her partner didn't seem to be in any immediate danger yet she still found it disturbing. For someone who was portrayed as being extremely dangerous, this was not the sort of reaction she had been expecting. Quiet your mouth. I will bring God's judgment upon you with my own hands. Zenovia yelled before charging forward at Naruto. The teen casually slipped his hand into the pocket of his pants before pulling out a small kunai, much to Irina's alarm. Zenovia got within reach of Naruto and swung her blade directly at the teen's neck. The blonde raised his kunai in accordance to block the power-backed swing. Sword met kunai and a massive burst of energy traveled through the air as the chakra-enhanced metal of Naruto's kunai clashed with the holy energy emitting from the blade of Charlemagne. Unsurprisingly, the holy sword won out as Naruto's kunai shattered as if made from glass. The blonde was forced to duck down as Zenovia continued through with the rest of her swing. You should have expected that. The sword had the capability to make giant craters and you think your little blade would hold out against it? Kurama commented as his container rolled away from the sword wielder. Zenovia quickly closed the distance between the two and attempted to cut Naruto down during his roll. The blonde was too quick, however, as he sprang into the air, narrowly dodging the girl's blade and the burst of power that followed it. I was thinking that my chakra would have helped me out a bit but obviously it didn't. Naruto mentally replied as five kunai briefly appeared in his hands before they were sent flying towards Zenovia. From her position on the ground, the exorcist raised her massive blade in front of her and allowed the projectile to bounce harmlessly off of its surface. Your tiny knives are nothing compared to the sword blessed by God's will. Zenovia proclaimed before stabbing the point of her blade into the ground. The earth seemed to ripple and crack as the energy from the sword flowed through it straight towards Naruto. The blonde was forced to leap away from the path of the energy lest he be pierced by a spike made from the earth. That sword really is something. I don't even want to imagine what someone like Kisame or Zabuza could have done with it in their hands. That was not something the blonde wanted to imagine. He was pretty sure he wouldn't be here right now if Zabuza had that sword in hand during his mission to wave country. The blonde didn't have much time to ponder anymore, what if says Zenovia appeared in his face once again. The girl thrust the point of her sword at Naruto's midsection, hoping to catch the blonde off guard. This would prove to be her ultimate mistake as Naruto easily dodged the sluggish stab and chopped at the girl's wrist. The strength behind the blondes hit Jared Zenovia's wrist and forced her to relinquish her hold on the sword. The exorcist immediately attempted to reach out and grab it before it fell to the ground but was kicked away by Naruto before she could do so. No! Both Irina and Zenovia yelled as the blue-haired girl was sent flying away from the holy sword. Irina ran from her position at the edge of the clearing and assisted Zenovia back to her feet as both girls kept their eyes on Naruto. The Excalibur fragment had since fallen and landed directly at the blonde's feet. The sword's blue blade and golden edge shone brightly in the midday sunlight as Naruto reached down to pick it up. Both Irina and Zenovia tensed as the blonde's fingers wrapped around the sword's hilt. A large pulse of energy emitted from the sword as soon as Naruto came within contact of it. The pulse of energy spread throughout the entirety of the clearing, blowing back in grass and the leaves while also forcing the two exorcists to brace themselves against it. The pulse of energy seemed to spread outwards for a mile as the whole city of Kuo could feel it. Everyone from Kokobil, who was hidden within the confines of his base, to Kaneko, who was suffering through the throes of education, felt the pulse wash over them. The energy coming from it was calming, serene almost. It made even the fallen angel's hate-filled heart skip a beat as the calming nature of the energy clashed with his anger. Wow! Irina commented as Naruto rose to his full height with Excalibur destruction in hand. The aura the blonde had held previously seemed to take on a whole new intensity as it literally glowed around him. He seemed almost holy in nature as he lackadaisically swung the blade side from side. Seems that the sword is responding to your inyang chakra. Whatever energy coming from the sword seems to be similar to it. Kurama commented as Naruto took several practice swings. The sword was much lighter than what his size depicted it to be. The golden edge of the blade seemed to hum with energy as its hilt melded perfectly with his hand. You think so? 
I think it's responding to the natural energy. The pulse of energy felt very similar to the purified chakra I've been releasing into the forest. The blonde thoughtfully said to himself as he took his final swing of the sword before resting the blade against his shoulder while looking over at the duo of exorcist. The two were staring at him with clear shock in their eyes. It seemed that they hadn't expected him to be able to actually wield the sword. The sword must be similar to Samahada. Very picky with who wields its. Luckily for me, I'm really hard to turn down. Except to Sakura. Shut up, stupid fox. Someone report to me immediately what that energy was before I remove their head and extract that information myself. To say that Kokabil was angry would be a vast understatement. The man was absolutely livid. And, of course, the source of this vast feeling of anger was our blonde shinobi friend. Unfortunately for the fallen angels working underneath the warmonger, they didn't know that. The energy seemed to have originated from the western half of Ko. I think everyone in the city felt it. Kokabil growled at the information or the general lack of it. Anyone or anything that was strong enough to produce such a large amount of energy was something to be weary of. Someone find me what exactly made that energy immediately. I will not keep letting these unknowns stop my plans. Kaneko had to restrain her Nekashu ears from unveiling themselves as a familiar wave of energy washed over her body. The girl was currently sat in the middle of one of her classes and thus did not have the luxury of being with her club members or her boyfriend where she could actually show her features. Instead, she was stuck within the confines of this classroom. I have a feeling that he's behind this somehow. The girl thought to herself as her eyes narrowed. The chances of Naruto somehow being the cause of that burst of energy were extremely large. Action and trouble seemed to revolve naturally around the blonde. He was like a magnet to it. Kaneko-san. The Nekashu was brought out of her thoughts by a soft voice. She turned to her right and saw one of her classmates sat beside her. The student pointed towards the door where Kiba stood with his arm folded across his chest. Sorry to interrupt your class, everyone, but Kaneko's presence is needed at the moment. Her absence has already been cleared with the student council. The boy's words carried through the silent classroom and the teacher seemed to give no protest as Kaneko stood from her desk and exited the class. I wonder what trouble you've gotten into this time, Naruto. On the outskirts of Kuo, a certain black-haired human paused as he felt a wave of energy wash over him. The spear strapped loosely to his hip seemed to hum and glow in response to the energy as it dispersed through the air. A small smirk made its way to the human's face as he resumed his walk, now with much more urgency in his stride. I wonder if that's from our new friend. If this is just a taste of the power he possesses, I think we're going to be wonderful friends. Back with the trio, Irina had managed to recover from the shock of losing yet another fragment of Excalibur and had drawn her own sword at Naruto. I demand you relinquish possession of Excalibur immediately or you shall face the wrath of the church. The blonde screamed as Naruto casually stood at the opposite end of the field. The fear that had previously gripped her heart had increased tenfold as she realized the implications of their actions. Losing yet another piece of the Excalibur would not only weaken the church but would also draw the wrath of Michael onto them. She had to retrieve the fragment. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the girl's demand for glancing down at the shouldered sword. He glanced back up at the duo of exorcist before glancing back down at the sword. This process continued for several seconds, unknowingly forcing the tension to rise between the trio. Okay, I'm not much of a sword guy anyway. Plus I know how you sword wielders can be about your weapons. Keeping this will cause me more harm than anything star. The tension dissipated like smoke as Naruto lifted the sword from his shoulder and sent it flying through the air at the girls. The holy sword embedded in the ground right in front of the exorcists, its previous glow quickly fading as the Christian duo stared at it in shock. I... I don't understand. Zenovia muttered as she stared at the holy blade. Irina wasn't much better as all she could do was nod in agreement at her partner's observation. Naruto, sensing that the girls weren't talking anytime soon, decided that it was most likely the best time to leave. It was fun fighting with you girls. Feel free to stop by the shop anytime. Valley, if I beat you back, I'm docking your pay for the day. And with those words, the blonde disappeared from the clearing in a fluster of leaves. A loud series of cursing followed the blonde's comment before a blue flash of light briefly appeared within the foliage of a tree only to fade away shortly afterwards, leaving two dazed and confused exorcists in the clearing all alone. What in Lord's name just happened? I have absolutely no idea. And, have to admit, I'm a bit conflicted about this chapter. I'm not entirely sure how it's going to be received. 
the conflicted feelings mostly comes from Zenobia. In the manga and anime, she can act a bit idiotic at times and I tried to play off of that in this chapter but I hope I didn't overdo it. Don't worry, she won't be as bad in the future. That's it for part 4. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.